Yet Egypt would come too. Ruit's complacency. Within two decades of coming to power, Cyrus had conquered first the Anatolian kingdom of Lydia and then Babylonia, to become the undisputed ruler of an empire stretching from the shores of the Aegean to the mountains of the Hindu Kush. Suddenly, out of the blue, there was a frightening new superpower in the region with a seemingly relentless appetite for conquest. All Amos II could do was hire more Greek mercenaries, build up his naval forces, and hope for the best. Cyrus's death in 530, while fighting the fierce Scythian nomads of Central Asia, seemed to offer a glimmer of hope. However, any thought of a reprieve was swiftly dashed by events in Egypt itself. King Amos, with his army, background and strategic ability, had successfully held the line for four decades. So his demise in 526 and the accession of a new, untried and untested pharaoh, Somtek III, 526 to 525, dealt the country a blow. The death of a monarch was always a time of vulnerability, but with an aggressor on the doorstep, it was nothing short of a disaster for Egypt. The new great king of Persia, Cambyses, saw an opportunity and seized it. Within weeks of receiving the news of Amos's death, he was on the march and heading for the delta. In 525, his forces invaded Egypt, captured Memphis, executed Somtek III, and forcibly incorporated the two lands into the growing Persian realm. Cambyses lost no time in imposing Persian-style rule on his latest dominion. He abolished the office of God's wife of Amun, denying Amos's daughter her inheritance and pushing aside the incumbent. God's wife of Amun, Ankhnes Ferebra, who had been in office for a remarkable sixty years. There would be no more God's wives to act as a focus for native Egyptian sentiment in Upper Egypt. Not that every Egyptian official saw the Persian takeover as a calamity. Some found it only too easy to change allegiance when faced with the new reality. One such was the overseer of works Gnamibra. Coming from a long line of architects that stretched back 750 years to the reign of Ramses II, Gnamibra, like his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather before him, bore an overtly loyalist name in his case the throne name of Amos II, and he had served his pharaoh faithfully in the quarries of the Wadi Hammamat. But for all his professed loyalty to the Sayite dynasty, he showed no hesitation in accommodating himself to the Persian invasion. He not only survived the change of regime, he prospered, continuing to serve his new Persian masters and being rewarded for his trouble with a clutch of lucrative priestly offices. 4. Many like Knamibra, personal advancement trumped patriotism every time. Others may have had slightly more altruistic reasons for collaborating with the Persians. For the Egyptian elite, nothing embodied their cherished culture and traditions better than their religion. Indeed, every prominent member of society took pains to demonstrate his piety to his town cult, an active patronage of the local temple was a prerequisite for winning respect in one's community when faced with alien conquerors who worshipped strange gods. Some Egyptians decided not to fight but to try to win the Persians over. To the Egyptian way of doing things. A native of Say, proudest of Delta cities, managed to do just that. Wedjahorisnet had all the right credentials. His father had been a priest in the local temple, and Wedjahorisnet had grown up with a deep devotion to the goddess Nath. Like many a Sayite before him, he had pursued a career in the military, rising to the position of admiral. Under Amos II, his naval activities must have included sea battles against the invading Persians. He described the invasion as a great disaster, the like of which had never happened in this land, before. 1. Yet within months of Cambyses's victory, Wedjahorisnet had ingratiated himself with his new master, winning trust as a senior courtier and being appointed as the king's chief physician with intimate access to the royal presence. In public, Wedjahorisnet's conversion was as thorough as it was rapid, and he showed no trace of embarrassment in lauding the Persian invasion in glowing terms. Yet there was more than simple collaboration behind this astonishing volt face. With his knowledge of Egyptian customs, Wedjahorisnet was in a unique position to guide the country's new Persian masters and begin the process of Egyptianization, which would turn them into respectable, even legitimate, pharaohs.
an important step in this process was the composition of a royal titulary for Cambyses, which Wedge Horusnet masterminded and no doubt strongly encouraged. Little by little, slowly but surely, the Persians were acculturated, following in the footsteps of previous foreign dynasties, Hyksus, Libyan, and Kushite. Cambyses seems to have acquiesced to the process. With his vast and polyglot empire, he could ill afford to take a culturally purist view. Instead, he showed great tolerance for the different cultures and traditions within his realm. His predecessor Cyrus had released the Jews from their exile in Babylon, and Cambyses followed suit, protecting the large Jewish community in Egypt on the island of Abu. Elsewhere in the Nile Valley, he was perfectly willing to retain the services of Egyptian officials, and life for many people, especially in the provinces, continued much as before. Only in the military were Egyptian officers replaced and their leadership skills directed anew. As with Wedja Horusnet, having been forced to relinquish his naval command, the erstwhile admiral turned his talents to safeguarding and honoring his local temple. His position at court gave him special influence, and he set about using it to further the cult of Nath at Say. First, he complained to Cambyses about the foreigners who had desecrated the temple by installing themselves inside its sacred precinct, and he persuaded his master to issue an eviction notice. After further lobbying, Cambyses ordered the temple to be purified, and its priesthood and offerings reinstated, just as they had been before the Persian invasion. As Wedja Horusnet explained, His Majesty did these things because I caused His Majesty to understand the importance of say. 3. To set the seal on this conversion, Cambyses paid a personal visit to the temple and kissed the ground before the statue of Nath, as every king does. For the Persian conqueror was well on the way to becoming a proper pharaoh. The same pattern was followed at sites throughout Egypt. In the delta city of Teramu, the local bigwigs Mahs used his influence. He was overseer of the royal harem, to enrich his community in its cult. It may have helped that the Persian kings readily identified with the power of the local lion god, Mahs, but, here as elsewhere, the Determination of Egyptian officials to convert their new masters was a key factor behind developments in the first Persian period. At Memphis, burials of the sacred Apis bulls continued without interruption, and the Egyptian responsible for the cult could even boast of proselytizing the country's new rulers. I put fear of you, Apis, in the hearts of all people and foreigners of every foreign land who were in Egypt. 5. The Egyptians might have lost their political independence but they were determined to maintain their cherished cultural traditions. Age of Invention In reality, the Persian conquest of Egypt was far from being a great disaster. If anything, the country's new rulers brought a much-needed dynamism and energy to the government of the Nile Valley, breathing new life into its institutions and infrastructure. The high point of this renaissance was the reign of Cambyses's successor Darius I, 522. 486. He took a particularly keen interest in Egypt's repositories of learning, the houses of life attached to the major temples. From his royal palace at Susa, built by Egyptian craftsmen with ebony and ivory. From Nubia, he ordered Wedja Horusnet, by now an old and trusted retainer living at the Persian court, to return to say and restore the house of life after it had fallen into ruin. Perhaps drawing on the temple records, Darius is said to have codified the laws of Egypt to establish a firm basis for government. He recognized that Egypt was not just another satrapy in his empire. Egypt's great wealth and ancient culture gave it a special significance. And it was simply too important a possession to risk losing. Hence the satrap, Persian governor, based in Memphis was not allowed any control over economic affairs. Instead, these were the responsibility of a separate chancellor, who was also tasked with keeping an eye on the satrap, to prevent him from going native. Satraps were frequently recalled to Persia to account for their activities in person before the great king. On the whole, though, Darius ruled Egypt with a light touch. Native Egyptians continued to hold high office, the tribute exacted was not excessive, and contemporary documents suggest a degree of prosperity, even in the provinces.
The keys to Persian control were excellent communication with the rest of the empire, a good intelligence network, and strategically placed garrisons. From the island of Dorjanardi, in lower Nubia, to the deserts of the Sinai. Imposing fortresses ringed Egypt's perimeter, giving the Persians the means to put down any signs of insurrection quickly and decisively. When it came to exploiting Egypt's vast economic potential, Darius's priority was to encourage maritime trade between the Nile Valley and the Persian Gulf. In Upper Egypt, the overland track through the Wadi Hammamat to the Red Sea coast was reopened and was used regularly by Persian expeditions. In Lower Egypt, however, no such route existed, so a different solution had to be found. The answer was one of the greatest engineering projects in ancient Egyptian history, every bit as ambitious as the pyramids at Giza. Back in the heyday of Sayite control, Nekau II, 610 to 595, had initiated a scheme to build a canal between the Nile and the Red Sea. Now, a hundred years later, his idea was finally realized. Where the sites had merely dreamed, the Persians delivered. The result was a canal 150 feet wide. That ran for some 40 miles from the easternmost branch of the Nile. Along the Wadi Tumalat, to the Bitter Lakes and then southward to the Gulf of Suez. As ships sailed the four days journey from one end to the other, they passed massive stelae of pink granite, set up at strategic points along the canal. On each giant slab, 10 feet high and 7 feet wide. Carefully chosen scenes and texts emphasized Darius's dominion over his vast empire. One side of the stele depicted the great king under the protection of his Persian god Ahura Mazda, with an accompanying text in cuneiform, the other side showed the emblem of Egyptian unification under a winged sun disk, with a laudatory inscription in hieroglyphics. In time-honored pharaonic fashion, the Egyptian version also included a frieze of 24 kneeling figures, each perched on an oval ring containing the name of an imperial province. Such scenes would have been a familiar sight to any Egyptian acquainted with the great temples of the land, except that, on Darius's monuments, one of the subject territories was Egypt itself. Little comfort that it was listed alongside such exotic and fabled lands as Persia, Media, Babylonia, Assyria, and even India. Darius drove the message home on the other side of the stela, where he boasted I, a Persian, with Persians, I seized Egypt. I gave orders to dig a canal from the river that is in Egypt. The Nile is its name, to the bitter river, that is, the Red Sea, that flows from Persia. 6. To celebrate the official opening of his landmark project in 497, the king paid a personal visit to the canal and looked on proudly as a fleet of 24 ships laden with Egyptian tribute made its way slowly eastward, bound for Persia. If the ancient Suez Canal was born of an interest in maritime trade routes, the Persians' desire to control the desert routes across the Sahara, on the other side of Egypt, spawned an equally impressive feat of engineering. Kergeia, the southernmost of the four great Egyptian oases, had long been a key nexus in desert communication. Where a network of tracks converged, linking the Nile Valley with Nubia, to the south, and the lands beyond the Sahara, to the west. Not since the late Old Kingdom had the Kergea oasis been permanently settled. The climate had become simply too arid, the annual rainfall insufficient to support even a small population. With their customary ingenuity, the Persians had two answers to the problem. First, they introduced the camel to Egypt. Brought from their Bactrian and Arabian provinces, it revolutionized desert travel, enabling caravans to travel far greater distances without the need to find water. Second, the Persians pioneered an extraordinary technique for bringing the water trapped inside the underground sandstone aquifer to the surface. Throughout the Kergea oasis, they excavated deep underground rock-cut galleries that ran for miles across the parched landscape. These were, in effect, subterranean aqueducts, enabling gardens and fields on the surface to be irrigated with sweet, fresh artesian water. Thanks to this advanced technology, vast tracts of land were brought into agricultural production for the first time, yielding abundant crops of cereals, fruit, and vegetables, and cotton, another Persian. Introduction
new villages and towns sprang up around the aqueducts. Complete with administrative buildings and temples. Because of the distance of these settlements from the Nile Valley, papyrus was rare and costly, so instead the local inhabitants used shards of pottery as a writing medium for their correspondence. As a result, an extraordinary archive has been preserved that illuminates daily life in this far-flung outpost of Persian imperialism. As might have been expected, individuals and institutions took care to preserve particularly valuable documents. Besides the receipts, household accounts, and everyday jottings, legal contracts feature heavily. They reveal that the basis of the local inhabitants' wealth was not land but water. The water supply from each rock-cut aqueduct was carefully divided into days and fractions of days, and these could be bought and sold, rented, or used to guarantee loans. In this desert oasis, water was, quite literally, money. There was coinage, too. In 410, the Athenian currency, Statra was introduced as the monetary standard, revealing the pervasive influence of the Greek world on Egyptian commerce. It was yet another sign of the cosmopolitan character of Persian Egypt, a land where people married across the religious and cultural divide, where reliefs in Egyptian temples could depict strange winged creatures from Zoroastrian mythology, and where second-generation Persian immigrants could adopt Egyptian nicknames. All in all, Egypt under Darius I was a dynamic melting pot of peoples and traditions, a place of cultural innovation, a prosperous trading nation, and a tolerant multi-ethnic community. But it was not to last. Survival of the fittest. Darius's successors showed markedly less interest in their Egyptian satrapy. They ceased even to pay lip service to the traditions of Egyptian kingship and religion. Commercial activity began to decline and political control slackened as the Persians focused their attention increasingly on their troublesome western provinces and the terrorist states seven of Athens and Sparta. Against such a backdrop of political weakness and economic malaise, the Egyptians' relationship with their foreign masters started to turn sour. A year before Darius I's death, the first revolt broke out in the delta. It took the next great king, Xerxes I, 486 to 465, two years to quell the uprising. To prevent a recurrence, he purged Egyptians from positions of authority, but it could not stop the rot, as Xerxes and his officials were preoccupied with fighting the Greeks at the epic battles of Thermopylae and Salamis, members of the old provincial families across Lower Egypt, began to dream of regaining power, a few even went as far as to claim royal titles. After less than half a century, Persian rule was beginning to unravel. The murder of Xerxes I in the summer of 465 provided the opportunity and stimulus for a second Egyptian revolt. This time, it was led by Arthururu, a charismatic prince of Say following in the family tradition, and the revolt was not so easily suppressed. Within a year, he had won supporters across the delta and further afield, even Government scribes in the Kergeo oasis dated legal contracts to year. Two of Arthururu, prince of the rebels. Only in the far southeast of the country, in the quarries of the Wadi Hammamat, did local officials still recognize the authority of the Persian ruler. Sensing the popularity of his cause, Arthururu appealed to the Persians' great enemy, Athens, for military support. Still smarting from the vicious destruction of their Holy sites by Xerxes's army two decades earlier, the Athenians were only too glad to help. They dispatched a battle fleet to the Egyptian coast, and the combined Greco-Egyptian forces succeeded in driving the Persian military back to their barracks in Memphis, and in keeping them pinned down there for many months. But the Persians were not going to give up their richest province so easily. Eventually, by sheer force of numbers, they broke out of Memphis and began to take the country back, region by region. After a struggle lasting nearly a decade, Arthururu was finally captured and crucified as a grim warning to other would-be insurgents. The Egyptians, however, had enjoyed their brief taste of freedom. And it was not long before another rebellion broke out, once again, under Sayite leadership, and once again with Athenian support. Only the peace treaty of 449 between Persia and Athens brought a
temporary halt to Greek involvement in Egyptian internal affairs, and allowed the resumption of free commerce and travel between the two Mediterranean powers. One beneficiary of the new dispensation was Herodotus, who visited Egypt sometime in the 440s, yet Egyptian. Discontent did not evaporate. The prospect of another major uprising looked certain. In 410, civil strife erupted across the country, with near anarchy and intercommunal violence flaring in the deep south. At the instigation of the Egyptian priests of Kanum, on the island of Abu, thugs attacked the neighboring Jewish temple of Yahweh. The perpetrators were arrested and imprisoned, but, even so, it was a sign that Egyptian society was in upheaval. In the Delta, a new generation of princes took up the banner of independence, led by the grandson of the first rebel leader. Of forty years before, Samtek Aminertes of Say was named after his grandfather but also bore the proud name of the founder of the Sayite dynasty, and he was determined to restore the family's fortunes. He launched a low-level guerrilla war in the Delta against Egypt's Persian overlords, using his detailed local knowledge to wear down his opponents. For six years, the rebellion continued unabated, the Persians discovering the impotence of a superpower against a determined uprising with popular local support. Finally the tipping point came. In 525, Cambyses had taken full advantage of the pharaoh's death to launch his takeover of Egypt. Now, the Egyptians returned the compliment. When news reached the delta, in early 404 that the great king Darius II had died, Aminertes promptly declared himself monarch. It was only a gesture, but it had the desired effect of galvanizing support across Egypt. By the end of 402, the fact of his kingship was recognized from the shores of the Mediterranean to the first cataract. A few waverers in the provinces continued to date. Official documents by the reign of the great king Artaxerxes II, hedging their bets, but the Persians had troubles of their own. An army of reconquest, assembled in Phoenicia to invade Egypt and restore order to the rebellious satrapy, had to be diverted at the last moment to deal with another secession in Cyprus. Having thus been spared a Persian onslaught, Aminertes might have been expected to welcome the renegade Cypriot admiral when he sought refuge in Egypt. But, instead of rolling out the red carpet for a fellow freedom fighter, Aminertes had the admiral promptly assassinated. It was a characteristic display of Sayite double-dealing. Despite such ruthlessness, Aminertes did not long enjoy his newly won throne. By seizing power through cunning and brute force, he had stripped away any remaining mystique from the office of Pharaoh, revealing the kingship for what it had become, or, behind the heavy veil of decorum and propaganda, had always been, the preeminent political trophy. Scions of other powerful Delta families soon took note. In October 399, a rival warlord from the city of Jadet staged his own coup, ousting Aminertes and proclaiming a new dynasty. To mark this new beginning, Neforud of Jadet consciously adopted the Horus name of Samtek I, the most recent founder of a dynasty who had delivered Egypt from foreign rule. But there the comparison ended. Ever wary of Persian reprisals, Neforud's brief reign, 399 to 393, was marked by feverish defensive activity. His most significant foreign policy was to cement an alliance with Sparta, sending grain and timber to assist the Spartan king Age Silaus in his Persian expedition. In 393, when Neforud's heir Hagar became king, a native born son succeeded his father on the throne of Egypt for the first time in five generations. Despite having a name that meant the Arab, Hagar was proud of his Egyptian identity and was determined to fulfill the traditional obligations of monarchy. A favorite epithet at the start of his reign was he who satisfies the gods. But piety alone could not guarantee security. After barely a year of rule, the internecine rivalry between Egypt's leading families struck again. This time, it was Hagar's turn to be deposed, when a competitor usurped both the throne and the monuments of the fledgling dynasty. As the merry-go-round of pharaonic politics continued to spin, it was only another twelve months before Hagar won back his throne, proudly proclaiming that he was repeating his appearance as king. But it was a hollow boast. 
the monarchy had sunk to an all-time low. Devoid of respect and stripped of mystique, it was but a pale imitation of past. Pharaonic glories. Hagar managed to cling to power for another decade, but his ineffectual son, a second Neforud, lasted barely. Sixteen weeks. In October 380, an army general from Chibnecha seized the throne. He represented the third Delta family to rule Egypt in just two decades. However, Niknebef, 380-362, was a man in a different mold from his immediate predecessors. He had witnessed firsthand the recent bitter struggle between competing warlords, including the disaster of the king who came before, ate and understood better than most the throne's vulnerability. As an army man, he knew that military might was a prerequisite for political power. Therefore, his number one priority, with the country living under the constant threat of Persian invasion, was to be a mighty king who guards Egypt, a copper wall that protects Egypt. 9. But he also appreciated that force alone was not sufficient. Egyptian kingship had always worked best on a psychological level. Not for nothing did Niknebef describe himself as a ruler who cuts out the hearts of the treason hearted. 10. If the monarchy were to be restored to a position of respect, it would need to project a traditional uncompromising image to the country at large. So, hand in hand with the usual political maneuvering, such as assigning all the most influential positions in government to his relatives and trusted supporters, Niknebef embarked upon the most ambitious temple building program the country had seen for 800 years. He wanted to demonstrate unequivocally that he was a pharaoh in the traditional mold. In the same vein, one of his very first acts as king was to assign one-tenth of the royal revenues collected at Naukratis, from customs dues on riverine imports and taxes levied on locally manufactured goods, to the temple of Nath at Say. That achieved the twin aims of placating his Sayite rivals while promoting his own credentials as a pious king. Further endowments followed, not least two. The temple of Horus at Edfu. Nothing could be more appropriate than for the god's earthly incarnation to give generously to his patrons. Principal cult center. Niknebef was not simply interested in buying credit in heaven. He also recognized that the temples controlled much of the country's temporal wealth, agricultural land, mining rights, craft workshops, and trading agreements, and that investing in them was the surest way to boost the national economy. This, in turn, was the quickest and most effective method of generating surplus revenue with which to strengthen Egypt's defensive capability, in the form of hired Greek mercenaries. So placating the gods and building up the army were two sides of the same coin. Yet it was a tricky balancing act. Milk the temples too eagerly, and they might come to resent being used as cash cows. A wise student of his country's history, Niknebef moved to avoid the dynastic strife of recent decades by resuscitating the ancient practice of co-regency, appointing his heirster, 365 to 360, as joint sovereign to ensure a smooth transition of power. However, the greatest threat to Jir's throne came not from internal rivals but from his own cavalier domestic and foreign policies. Sharing none of his father's caution, he began his sole reign by setting out to seize Palestine and Phoenicia from the Persians. Perhaps he wished to recapture the glories of Egypt's imperial past, or perhaps he felt the need to take the war to the enemy to justify his dynasty's continued grip on power. Either way, it was a rash and foolish decision. Even though Persia was distracted by a satrap's revolt in Asia Minor, it could hardly be expected to contemplate the loss of its Near Eastern possessions with equanimity. Moreover, the vast resources needed by Egypt to undertake a major military campaign risked putting an unbearable strain on the country's still fragile economy. Stir badly needed bullion to hire Greek mercenaries, and was persuaded that a windfall tax on the temples was the easiest way of filling the government's coffers. Hence, alongside a tax on buildings, a poll tax, a purchase tax on commodities, and extra dues on shipping, Stur moved to sequestrate temple property. It would have been difficult to conceive of a more unpopular set of policies. To make matters worse, the Spartan mercenaries hired with all this tax revenue, 
a thousand hoplite troops, and thirty military advisors, came with their own officer, Egypt's old ally Age Silaus. At the age of eighty four, he was a veteran in every sense of the word, and he was not about to be palmed off with the command of a mercenary corps. Only command of the entire army would satisfy him. Fergster, that meant shunting aside another Greek ally, the Athenian Shabrias, who had first been hired by Hagar in the 380s to oversee Egyptian defense policy. With Shabrias placed in charge of the navy, H. Silaus won control of the land forces. But the presence of three such large egos at the top of the chain of command threatened to destabilize the entire operation. With resentment in the country at large over the punitive taxes, an atmosphere of suspicion and paranoia pervaded the expedition from the outset. The most vivid account of events surrounding Jerzil faded. Campaign of 360 is provided by an eyewitness, a snake doctor from the central delta by the name of Wenifer. Born fewer than 10 miles. From the dynastic capital of Chibnecha, Wenifer was just the sort of faithful follower favored by Nekneveth and his regime. After early training in the local temple, Wenifer specialized in medicine and magic, and it was in this context that he came to Tjur's attention. When the king decided to launch his campaign against Persia, Wenifer was entrusted with keeping the official war diary. Words had great magical potency in ancient Egypt, so this was a highly sensitive role for which an accomplished magician and arch loyalist was the obvious choice. Yet no sooner had Wenifer set out with the king and the army on their march into Asia than a letter was delivered to the regent in Memphis implicating Wenifer in a plot. He was arrested, bound in copper chains, and taken back to Egypt to be interrogated in the regent's presence. Like any successful official in 4th century Egypt, Wenifer was adept at extricating himself from compromising situations. Through some astute maneuvering, he emerged from his ordeal as a loyal confidant of the regent. He was given official protection and showered with gifts. In the meantime, before a shot had been fired, most of the army had begun to desert Stur in favor of one of his young officers, no less a personage than Prince Nectharep, Stur's own nephew and the Memphis regent's son. Age Silaus the Spartan reveled in his role as kingmaker and threw his lot in with the prince, accompanying him back to Egypt in triumph, fighting off a challenger, and finally seeing him installed as pharaoh. For his pains, he received the princely sum of 230 silver talents, enough to bankroll 5,000 mercenaries for a year, and headed home to Sparta. By contrast, Jter, disgraced, deserted, and deposed, took the only option available and fled into the arms of the Persians, the very enemy he had been preparing to fight. Wenifer was promptly dispatched at the head of a naval task force to comb Asia and track down the traitor. Stur was eventually located in Susa, and the Persians were only too glad to rid themselves of their unwelcome guest. Wenifer brought him home in chains, and was showered with gifts by a grateful king. In a time of political instability, it paid to be on the winning side. Animal magic. Egypt's cat and mouse game with the mighty Persian Empire in the 4th century determined not just its domestic and foreign policies, but also its national psychology. The ever-present threat of reconquest and the constant need for defensive vigilance turned Egypt in on itself as it struggled to find the basis for a renewed sense of security. In a world of global forces, change, and uncertainty, the Egyptians looked increasingly to those traditions and values that defined them and set them apart from other cultures. The most enduring and distinctive feature of pharaonic civilization was its religion. Regarded with haughty disdain by the Greeks and with mystified detachment by the Persians, Egypt's plethora of animal deities embodied the best native Egyptian values. Moreover, the gods represented age-old, unchanging forces that promised ultimate salvation, whatever the vicissitudes of real life, change and decay in all around I see, O thou who changest not, abide with me. 11. Sacred animal cults had a long history in the Nile Valley, animals had been buried in funerary enclosures in the early pre-dynastic period, and the Apis bull had been worshipped at Memphis since the foundation of the Egyptian state, but their rapid rise in popularity was
a defining phenomenon of Egypt's brief period of independence from Persian rule, and it led to some of the strangest practices ever witnessed in the land of the pharaohs. By the middle of the 4th century, animal cults were ubiquitous. There were sacred cats at Bast, sacred dogs and gazelles at Thebes, sacred bulls at Ayanit, sacred crocodiles at Shedit, even sacred fish at Jadet. Each cult had its own temple and priesthood, and because of the system of rotation used for temple employees, this meant that a large proportion of the population shared in the wealth of a nationwide phenomenon. One of the greatest concentrations of animal cults was at Saqqara, burial place of kings and nobles since the dawn of history. By the reign of Nakhtarep, 360-343, Egypt's dead elite found themselves joined in their subterranean world by a veritable menagerie of beasts, great and small. One of the most holy places on the Saqqara Plateau was the Serapeum, where temples and workshops on the surface covered a vast underground catacomb for the Apis bulls. Nearby stood a further complex of temple, hypogeum, and administrative buildings serving the cult of the mother of Apis, a sacred cow worshipped as the incarnation of the goddess Isis. After its death, each successive cow was purified, embalmed, wrapped in linen bandages, and adorned with amulets before being interred in a subterranean vault that had taken up to two years to excavate from the living rock. The huge stone sarcophagus carved for every mother of Apis was so heavy that the team of thirty men required to haul it into place could command up to a month's wages for ten days of backbreaking work. Beyond the catacombs for the sacred bulls and their mothers, there was a vast network of underground galleries for mummified baboons. Brought by river or sea all the way from sub-Saharan Africa, only a few were successfully bred in captivity, the apes were kept in a special compound inside the Temple of Ptah at Memphis. There, they were worshipped as manifestations of Thoth, the god of wisdom, and embodiments of the hearing ear that acted as intermediary between people and the gods. Animals were thus the saints of ancient Egyptian religion. After death, each baboon was deified as Osiris and buried in a rectangular wooden box, which was placed in a niche cut into the rock walls of the subterranean vault. The niche was sealed with a limestone slab bearing the name of the baboon, its place of origin, and a prayer. A typical inscription read, Pilgrims came to Saqqara from far and wide seeking advice, insight into the future, cures for sickness, even success in court cases, all in the hope that Osiris the baboon would carry their supplication to the gods in return for a votive offering or for the pious act of mummifying and burying one of the sacred animals. The area thronged with fortune tellers, interpreters of dreams, astrologers, soothsayers, and purveyors of magical amulets, plying their dubious trades among the countless worshippers. As for the myriad priests and embalmers, they also made a handsome living out of the pilgrims, especially as they often substituted cheaper, smaller monkeys for the rarer, more expensive baboons, because the animal was hidden beneath mummy wrappings. The purchaser could not tell the difference. Perhaps the most extensive of all the animal cemeteries at Saqqara were the ibis galleries. Ibises, like baboons, were sacred to the god. Thoth, and the desperate search for wisdom led the Egyptians to mummify and bury up to two million birds at Saqqara alone. Each ibis gallery measured 30 feet wide by 30 feet high, and was filled from floor to ceiling with neat stacks of pottery jars, each containing a mummified body part or an entire corpse of a sacred ibis. To keep pace with demand, ibises were bred on an industrial scale, on the shores of nearby Lake Abusir and at other farms throughout Egypt. At Kamun, the principal cult center of Thoth, a vast area was devoted to feeding the flocks of birds. When they died, even the tiniest parts of them, individual feathers, nest material, fragments of eggshell, were carefully gathered up for sale and burial. Indeed, the ibis priests would often bury the birds' dead bodies in the ground to speed up decomposition, making it easier to separate individual bones and turn a quick profit. The use of turpentine, imported from Tyre, accelerated the process still further but had the unfortunate side effect of scorching the bones inside the mummy package. But by then, the pilgrim had 
paid the fee and gone home. The final catacomb at Saqqara was devoted to falcons, sacred too. The god Horus. Here, Egyptian ingenuity went a stage further. As well. As dedicating mummified falcons, visitors could also purchase and donate Horus statuettes. The hollow base of the statuette, accessed through a sliding panel, could accommodate either an inducement. For example, a mummified scrap of shrew, by way of a snack for the falcon deity, or a prayer, written on a roll of papyrus. By packaging the prayer and offering together, the pilgrim could be sure of delivering request and payment at the same time, for added efficacy. As a solar deity, Horus enjoyed a special affinity with Thoth. Associated with the moon, so ibises and falcons formed a natural pairing. But there was another, less subtle reason for the popularity of the falcon cult at Saqqara. The cult was actively encouraged and sponsored by the state. Not that the government was much interested in popular religion, but it was keen to promote the cult of the king. And, according to ancient beliefs, the monarch was the earthly incarnation of Horus. More than that, Nikthareps very name alluded to the cult of Horus, Horus of Hebe is victorious, so king and falcon were identified even more closely than usual. The cult of Nikthareps the falcon was fostered alongside the sacred animal cult, so that the two became virtually indistinguishable. It was a policy carefully calculated to harness popular religion in the service of the monarchy. Right from the beginning of his reign, Nikthareps recognized the power of beliefs and symbols to consolidate support for himself and his dynasty. One of his first orders to his loyal servant Wenifer was to restore the 2,000-year-old mortuary cults of Sneferu and Jedifra, two kings from the height of the Pyramid Age. The propaganda value in reviving these institutions was considerable. Since it publicly associated Egypt's new ruler with two of his most illustrious predecessors. Beyond Memphis, too, Nikthareb indulged in a frenzy of building not seen since the reign of Ramses II. Scarcely a temple in the country escaped some form of royal beautification. Nikthareb wanted to be regarded by his contemporaries as well as by posterity as a true pharaoh, not merely the latest in a long line of warlords that were here today, gone tomorrow. But there was also a hint of panic in his orgy of construction. He concentrated much of his effort on gateways and enclosure walls the most vulnerable parts of temples, and seems to have felt an overriding need to protect Egypt's sacred buildings from malign forces. In this respect, his religious policy was of a piece with his international agenda. Both were focused on safeguarding Egypt from the enemy. As for the Persians, they never accepted the secession of their most affluent province. No amount of temple building, mummification of sacred animals, or pharaonic posturing would deflect them from their aim of recapturing the Nile Valley. Back in 373, Nikhnebev had successfully repelled an attempted Persian invasion directed against the Delta. Thirty years later, his grandson Nikhtharep was not so lucky. The forces of the great King Artaxerxes III captured Pelusium, on the Mediterranean coast, with relative ease, and marched southward to Memphis. By the late summer of 343, the Egyptian capital had fallen, resistance had crumbled, and independence had been extinguished. Nikthareb, the last native-born Egyptian until the modern era to rule unchallenged over his homeland, fled abroad. In the end, his piety and politicking were no match for the sheer strength of Artaxerxes's army. The clock had been turned back seven decades and Egypt was once again a satrapy of the mighty Persian Empire. Holding out for a hero if anyone alive during the Persian invasion of 343 could have remembered. Cambyses's conquest 180 years earlier, they would have had an overwhelming sense of deja vu. Yet, for most, grown accustomed to a precarious independence, the country's forced reabsorption into a foreign realm must have seemed a genuine disaster. Many Egyptians, especially in the provinces, adopted a head-in-the-sand approach to the latest reversal of fortune. They hunkered down and continued with normal life as much as possible, quietly maintaining their native traditions as far as they could, in quiet defiance of their alien masters. A fine example of this tendency was Padiasur, a pious devotee of Thoth who lived in Kamun, 
the God's principal cult center. Day in, day out, as the thousands of sacred ibises squawked and screeched in the nearby feeding grounds, Hadiasur carried out his duties in the temple. With exemplary diligence, while, beyond his narrow horizons, the country seethed with unrest. Egypt's unshakable confidence in its own traditions was both its genius and its undoing. What had been the country's greatest strength? In happier, more settled times became its fatal weakness in the face of unfamiliar forces. The customs and solutions that had maintained Egyptian civilization in the third and second millennia were no longer up to the job. Egypt had lost its preeminence and was now just another country, albeit a wealthy one, to be fought over by younger, nimbler empires. Hadiasur's conscientious resignation was thus a symptom of a wider malaise. Frightened and bewildered by the rapidly changing global situation, most Egyptians preferred to look the other way, put their trust in their old gods, and carry on regardless. The last, feeble gasp of Egypt's once proud spirit of independence came at the end of 338. The stimulus was the death of yet another Persian great king. As the court in Persepolis mourned the passing of Artaxerxes III and prepared to crown his successor, the last in a long line of Egyptian freedom fighters stepped forward to liberate his country. Little is known for certain about the mysterious Kababash. His obscurity reflecting the hopelessness of his cause. He seems to have been a native of Memphis, or at least to have had a close association with the capital, and the city was one of the first places in Egypt to recognize his kingship. But Kababash's popularity was not confined to Lower Egypt. Thebes, too, threw its weight behind his attempt to seize the throne. From the upper reaches of the Nile Valley to the shores of the Delta, the whole country was anxious to cast off the Persian yoke. Kababash was the best, the only, bet. Recognizing that Persian retaliation was likely to be in the form of a seaborne invasion, he headed straight for the strategically important harbor city of Perwajet, crossing the marshlands that were in all its districts, penetrating the morass of Lower Egypt, and inspecting every estuary, leading to the Great Green, that is, the Mediterranean Sea, in order to repel the Asiatic fleet from Egypt. 14 It was a sensible enough strategy. But a rebel leader, even one with the hopes and aspirations of Egypt, riding on his shoulders, was no match for the Persian army at its mightiest and most determined. Kababash's insurrection lasted barely 18 months. His fate, like most things about him, remains a mystery. The final outcome was renewed Persian control, under a new great king, Darius III, 336-332 in Egypt, 336-331 in Persia. Egypt had never been more vital to the Persians. Its wealth was desperately needed to buy mercenary support for an increasingly embattled empire. For a century and a half, Persia had been grappling with the Greek world for control of the Aegean and Anatolia. Sparta and Athens had proved persistent thorns, putting up heroic resistance and humbling the great king's armies with acts of bravery and defiance. Now attention had swung northward to the mountainous kingdom of Macedon, which had recently taken on the mantle of Panhellenic leadership against the Persians. In the late summer of 336, at precisely the same time that Darius III was being enthroned at Persepolis, the new young king of Macedon, Alexander III, was winning recognition throughout Greece as head of the League of Corinth and commander of the Persian expedition initiated by his father. The world was at a turning point, if only Darius could have sensed it. By the spring of 334, Alexander had crossed the Hellespont, into Persia's western province, and marched southward to engage the massed ranks of the imperial army. The epic battle at the river Granicos in May that year signaled the beginning of the end for Darius and for Persia. Further campaigns in Anatolia followed during the summer, culminating in the siege of Halicarnassus. Ottoman winter saw Alexander's forces moving along the coast, sweeping all before them. In November 333, a second pitched battle between the two opposing armies was fought at Essos, in Cilicia. Ironically, the Persians counted a sizable number of Egyptians among their multi-ethnic forces. Ordinary soldiers no doubt fought for whoever paid them. But 
the willing collaboration extended also to members of the elite. Including the eldest son of the exiled Nekthorep, who apparently saw no contradiction in supporting the very army that had defeated his father. As it had shown time and again, the Egyptian military, even in its upper echelons, had one overriding wish, to align itself with the winning side. History is written by the victors, as the Egyptians, with a history longer than most, well knew. Now, however, history was running out for the Persians. An Egyptian collaborator, Semitewifnikt, watched from the sidelines as Darius suffered another crushing defeat. Suddenly, Alexander looked unstoppable, overcome with homesickness, or a powerful desire to save his own skin, Semitewifnikt fled the battlefield and returned to Egypt, there to await the installation of a new regime and further opportunities for advancement. As news reached the Nile Valley of Alexander, his thirst for glory and his invincible army, the Egyptians began to wonder whether he could be the strong man they were looking for to rid them of the hated Persians. In the absence of a native-born hero, and faced with a stark choice between Darius and Alexander, the Macedonian looked like the lesser of two evils. For sure, there could be no illusions about his methods. After the seven-month siege of Tyre in the first half of 332, Alexander had shown exemplary cruelty to those who had dared to oppose him, ordering the public crucifixion of the survivors. A few months later, the unfortunate governor of Gaza, a city that had also shut its gates against Alexander, suffered an even worse fate. The governor was tied to a chariot while still alive and driven around the city walls until he died from his wounds in excruciating agony. Nothing and no. One would be allowed to stand in Alexander's way. But the Egyptians had always been used to despotic rulers. Authoritarian dictators had been the norm in the Nile Valley for the best part of 3,000 years. As the country looked back to its glorious past with increasing nostalgia, it must have seemed that Alexander was a man very much in the traditional pharaonic mold, a ruthless tyrant, to be respected and feared. More important still, he was a proven winner, and Egypt longed for victory, if only by proxy. In the dying weeks of 332, Alexander marched across the Egyptian border and seized power without a fight. The Persians simply melted away. Here he was, the conqueror of the known world in the land of the pharaohs. Whether by instinct or through careful advice, he knew what was expected of him. One of his first acts on reaching Memphis was to pay his respects to the sacred Apis bull. The great beast was brought out from its stall into the adjoining courtyard for the curious Macedonian to inspect. For Alexander's hosts, it was a sign that the old ways had returned. Here was a king who understood the demands of piety. Yet, for Alexander himself, an interest in ancient Egypt's religious traditions was more than just a public relations exercise. Like all previous invaders, he was entranced by the country's age-old culture. Egypt was casting its inimitable, irresistible spell. Thus far, nothing had been allowed to delay or detain Alexander in his military crusade. Each victory had been the spur to another, giving the enemy no respite or time to regroup. Now, against all expectation, he deliberately turned his back on the Persians. In the early spring of 331, after founding the city that would bear his name for eternity, Alexander headed not eastward to engage Darius a third time but westward into the sandy wastes of the Sahara. His destination, 300 miles distant, was the Siwa oasis with its famed oracle of a moon. Whatever passed between God and King remained a mystery, but Alexander emerged. From the encounter a changed man, indeed, no longer a man but a living God, descended from the Creator himself. He put his question to the oracle and received, or so he said, the answer that his soul desired. 15 Thus did the ruler of Macedon become king of Egypt. The Nile Valley would not be ruled by one of its own sons for another 22 centuries, yet the allure of pharaonic civilization was as influential as ever. Hadiasur and his ilk had been proved right. Chapter 23 The Long Goodbye The Glittering Prize Alexander left Egypt in April 331, never to return. His stay had lasted barely four months.
Yet, in that brief time, he had not merely added the land of the pharaohs to his growing list of conquests and had himself recognized as a living god, with an eye on his empire's destiny, as well as his own, he had also put in place far-sighted administrative arrangements to ensure strong government in the Nile Valley after his departure. Alexander recognized that, although won by the sword, Egypt would not flourish under a military junta, so he ensured a clear separation of powers, leaving the military command in Macedonian hands, while civil matters were entrusted to two governors, one Egyptian and one Persian. Proud of his Greek inheritance, Alexander was nonetheless intent on building a multicultural empire, a world of opportunity where talented individuals of all ethnic backgrounds could rise to the top. The Nile Valley might now be Macedonian territory, but an Egyptian dignitary such as Semite Whitefnik could still amass honors and offices, confident of being blessed by his lord, revered in his gnome. One is Alexander's public display of piety to the Apis bull had been intended to emphasize, he wanted to present himself as a liberator, and an enlightened ruler who respected and honored Egypt's ancient traditions and beliefs. In this spirit, the Macedonian commander of the occupying forces, Pukestas, had a notice pinned up at the sacred animal necropolis at Saqqara, forbidding his troops from entering the ritual area. It survives to this day as one of the oldest known Greek documents on papyrus, and as a vivid demonstration of Alexander's inclusive ethos. Not everyone in Alexander's retinue, however, shared his broad-mindedness and his interest in good government. Very soon his carefully laid plans began to fall apart as his subordinates competing. Ambitions came to the surface. The Egyptian governor resigned, leaving his Persian counterpart in sole charge of the civilian administration. Before long, he was sidelined in turn, as the Greek commander in charge of the eastern border area and the country's finances, Cleomenes of Naucratus, won promotion to the post of satrap, with comprehensive powers. Despite Alexander's best endeavors, Egypt was on its way back to being a dictatorship. Alexander's untimely death, just eight years later, on June 10, 323, sealed the country's fate, as Alexander's closest lieutenants squabbled over the division of his vast empire, a general named Ptolemy, son of Logus, succeeded in being allocated the satrapy of Egypt, since he had accompanied his childhood friend Alexander on the visit to the Oracle of Amun, Ptolemy may have been able to argue that he had some claim to the province. He certainly knew that it was the wealthiest and easiest to defend of Alexander's many conquests. Ideally suited, in other words, to become, once again, a powerful kingdom in its own right. Without delay, Ptolemy traveled to Egypt, removed the unpopular Cleomenes, and set about consolidating his own authority. Taking charge of the two lands posed a knotty problem. Ptolemy might have held the reins of political and economic power, but he lacked the moral and spiritual authority that Alexander had possessed to reign over Egypt as pharaoh. With the great conqueror dead, the Egyptians might balk at another Macedonian monarch. Ptolemy knew that Alexander's imprimatur would be essential if he, a commoner, were to win recognition as a legitimate ruler. It had been Alexander's dying wish to be buried within the sacred precinct of the Temple of Amun at Siwa, but the new region of Macedon, Perdiccas, had decided for political reasons that the dead hero should be interred in the dynastic necropolis of the Macedonian kings at Aegina. Everyone, it seemed, wanted Alexander's body as a talisman of legitimacy, employing all his tactical skills, honed on the battlefields of the Near East, Ptolemy hatched an audacious plan to steal Alexander's corpse from right under Perdiccas's nose. As the funeral cortege made its way from Babylon, bound for the Hellespont, Ptolemy's army hijacked it in Syria and forced it to divert to Egypt. Once the hero's body was safely on Egyptian soil, Ptolemy showed his true colors. Rather than carrying out Alexander's wishes, he had the body buried at Memphis, traditional capital of the pharaohs. With Alexander's aura cast over the seat of government, Nobody could now deny Ptolemy his right to rule. It is not surprising that the deception incensed Perdiccas, provoking an immediate conflict between Macedon and Egypt, the first in a 
wearying series of internecine wars between Alexander's successors. That would drag on for 35 years. At the same time, the Greek penchant for deadly family feuds showed itself, laying waste to Alexander's surviving relatives within 12 years of his own death. First, his heir and half-brother Philip III was murdered at the behest of Alexander's mother, Olympias. Then, Alexander's posthumous son, Alexander IV, was murdered by his guardian. In Egypt, where the unvarnished truth had never been allowed to get. In the way of decorum, dates continued to be reckoned as if the younger Alexander were still alive and reigning. But it was nothing more than a political fig leaf, designed to conceal Ptolemy's real intentions beneath a veneer of loyalty. A year earlier, Ptolemy had moved his residence to Alexandria, Alexander's city by the sea. When the new capital was ready, the general made his move. On January 12, 304, he proclaimed himself king. One of his first acts as monarch was to have Alexander's body moved to Alexandria and reinterred in a glass-sided coffin in a lavish new tomb. There Alexander would lie for all eternity as a founding father and patron deity, not just of a new city, but also of a new dynasty. The house of Ptolemy had arrived. The next 80 years, under the first three Ptolemies, were the golden age of Ptolemaic rule. Though elevated to king, Ptolemy I lost none of his generals touch, using the interminable wars of the successors to carve out an empire in the eastern Mediterranean. He acquired Cyprus in 313, followed by strategic footholds in Anatolia and the Aegean. These he added to Cyrenaica, coastal Libya, which he had already annexed to Egypt just a year after Alexander's death. In the early 280s, Ptolemy won recognition as head of the Island League, securing his hegemony over the Cyclades. And he made strategic alliances with Macedon through diplomatic marriages to the daughters of two important families. When he died in the winter of 283 to 282, at the ripe old age of 84, Ptolemy I had succeeded in creating a buffer zone against invasion that would last for another two and a half centuries. The eventual outcome of the conflict between Alexander's successors was a threefold division of his realm. In the northwest, Macedon, his ancestral homeland, remained an independent kingdom. In the south, the Ptolemies ruled over Egypt, Cyrenaica, and Cyprus. The great central swath of territory, comprising southern Anatolia, the Near East, Mesopotamia, and Persia, had fallen to another of Alexander's generals, Seleucus, and the Seleucid kingdom emerged as a powerful rival to the Ptolemaic Empire. Territorial Disputes Between these three Hellenistic monarchies continued under Ptolemy II. And three, 285-246 and 246-221, erupting into the full-scale Syrian wars. Between the Ptolemaic and Seleucid powers, these periodic conflicts provided opportunities for a wealthy and well-defended state such as Egypt to extend its power still further. With the aid of a large naval fleet, Ptolemy II added southern and western Anatolia to his conquests. His successor Ptolemy III won control of the Ionian coast, the Hellespont, and southern Thrace. This territorial expansion was a means to an end, not an end in itself. For throughout the Ptolemaic lands, trade was at the heart of government policy. As with later world empires, Ptolemaic Egypt grew fabulously wealthy from commercial activity underpinned by extensive natural resources. Early in his reign, Ptolemy II launched a campaign against the Nubian kingdom of Meroe, and succeeded in seizing control of Lower Nubia, with its abundant gold reserves. To drive the point home, he founded a gold processing city in the Wadi Alaki. Named Berenika Pankrasos, All Gold Berenika, in honor of his redoubtable mother. Control of Nubia also had the added bonus of providing Egypt with a supply of African elephants, to pit against the awesome Indian war elephants of the Seleucid army. In another move, Ptolemy II ordered the Suez Canal, built by Darius some 230 years earlier, to be dredged and reopened to shipping. From ports on the Red Sea coast, ships plied the sea routes to India, riverboats sailed up the Nile to sub-Saharan Africa, while camel trains followed the overland routes west across the Sahara and east to Arabia. Under
Ptolemaic rule, Egypt was once again at the hub of a great trading empire. When it came to trumpeting their fabulous wealth and far-flung imperial connections, the Ptolemies were not given to modesty. In the winter of 275 to 274, Egypt witnessed one of the most magnificent pageants ever staged in the ancient world. From the cushioned comfort of a vast tent, erected within the walls of the royal citadel. Ptolemy II and 130 specially invited guests watched as a great ceremonial procession filed past. First came the statues honoring the dynasty's patron deities, Dionysus, Zeus, Alexander, and Ptolemy I. And his wife Berenica. Following them, exotic tribute from Africa. Arabia, and India thundered past, 24 elephant wagons. Antelope, ostriches, wild asses, leopards, a giraffe, a rhinoceros, and countless camels, then Nubians bearing tribute, colorful Indian women, cattle, and dogs, all of them fauna in Ptolemy's eyes. Finally came the military contingent, an essential element of any triumphalist procession, comprising 80,000 soldiers from the Ptolemaic army, where the pharaohs of the new kingdom had merely carved scenes of tribute on the walls of tombs and temples, the Ptolemies staged the real thing. In a more radical departure from pharaonic precedent, Ptolemy II's astonishing pomp took place not in Thebes or Memphis but in Alexandria, the jewel in the Ptolemaic crown. Since its foundation on April 7, 331, the city had grown into the leading commercial center of the Mediterranean world. Alexander had personally selected the location, and he had chosen well, since it was fewer than 20 miles from one of the Nile's main mouths, yet unaffected by the annual inundation, Alexandria was ideally situated for maritime trade. A double natural harbor, divided by a causeway, provided deep water anchorage for merchant shipping, and extensive wharfs were built for loading and unloading goods, as well as warehouses, shipyards, and the emporium, the waterfront also provided the perfect location for a theater and a temple to Poseidon, Greek god of the seas. Inland, the main city was laid out on a grid system, another Hellenistic trait, with two broad, hundred-foot-wide avenues intersecting at right angles. Along these boulevards were ranged the principal public spaces, notably the market square and the major temples. Indeed, as befitted an administrative and dynastic capital, precincts and palaces covered between one-quarter and one-third of the city. The Royal Mausoleum and colossal statuary, law courts, and a portico gymnasium. Monuments in Egyptian and Greek styles, in polished granite and dazzling marble, stood cheek by jowl in a mesmerizing blend of Hellenistic and pharaonic cultures. Alexandria was a place where two worlds met in a rich and heady mix, even if some native Egyptians insisted on referring to it, contemptuously, as the building site. No institution better demonstrated the Ptolemy's vision for Alexandria than the Great Library. Ptolemy I had been determined from the outset to steal Athens's crown and promote his capital as the paramount intellectual center of the Greek world. To this end, he established a scholarly academy within the palace quarter, presided over by a priest of the Muses. The museum swiftly became a powerhouse of research and teaching, as the Ptolemy sought out the best brains from across the Greek world and lured them to Alexandria. With the promise of academic freedom and a guaranteed salary, paid directly from the royal treasury, the museum buildings had all the necessary elements of a scholarly community, covered arcades with recesses and seats for quiet contemplation, a large dining hall, in which the learned members could meet and discuss ideas, and, of course, a library not just any library but the greatest collection of books in the ancient world, acquired by fair means or foul from the best book markets of the day. Ptolemy III was so desperate to acquire original editions of Greek literary classics that he even resorted to outright theft. His ruse was to borrow books from the libraries of Athens, in return for a hefty deposit of fifteen silver talents. As soon as the manuscripts had arrived safely in Alexandria, Ptolemy sent his. Thanks to the Athenians, they could keep the deposit, he was keeping. The books. In its heyday, the great library numbered half a million papyrus rolls. 
representing the sum total of knowledge in every field of inquiry. The wealth of its written holdings was matched only by its glittering array of scholarly talent, as successive directors of the library gathered about them an astonishing array of visiting academics. There were one or two Egyptians, notably Manithal, a priest of Sabenitos, Egyptian. Chibnecha, who was commissioned to write a history of Egypt, but the vast majority of Alexandria's intellectuals came from across the Greek world. Euclid, the founder of geometry, was brought from the Platonic school in Athens and organized the entire corpus of Greek mathematical knowledge into a unified system. The engineer Archimedes invented his water-lifting device while he was in Egypt. And the astronomer Aristarchus of Samos advanced the theory of a solar system with the sun at its center. In 245, the geographer and astronomer Eratosthenes was appointed director of the library. During his stay in Egypt, he accurately calculated the circumference of the earth by measuring the length of the shadow cast by a stick at Thessamy time of day in Aswan and Alexandria. His contemporaries in Alexandria included physicians steeped in the Hippocratic tradition, who established the basic workings of the nervous, digestive, and vascular systems, while the court poet Callimachus compiled a painstaking catalogue of books in the Great Library, laying the foundations for the survival of Greek learning into later antiquity and beyond. In a city of such intellectual wonders, one final architectural masterpiece quite literally beamed Alexandria's achievements to the far horizon. On a rocky islet connected to the mainland by a long breakwater stood the Pharos, towering hundreds of feet into the sky. Commissioned by Ptolemy I and completed by a successor in 280, it was a miracle of engineering. The great tower was built from blocks of stone weighing on average 75 tons, and the structure rose in three massive stories, by turn square, octagonal, and cylindrical. At the summit, topped by a gigantic statue of Zeus, was the crowning glory, a beacon that burned day and night. Its light, magnified by mirrors, was visible a vast distance out to sea, to guide people goods, and ideas from across the Mediterranean into the Ptolemies. Thriving metropolis. A practical landmark for shipping and a powerful symbol of Ptolemaic power, the Pharos epitomized the Greek mastery of Egypt. One country, two systems. The maritime world beyond Alexandria might have been thoroughly Greek. But the Delta and Nile Valley were a different matter. Ptolemaic law. Recognized only three autonomous cities, Polis, in Egypt, Alexandria itself, the ancient trading center of Naucratus, and the new foundation of Ptolemaeus, established by Ptolemy I near Abju, in Upper Egypt, as a counterweight to the traditional hegemony of Thebes. In each polis, the citizens enjoyed special tax privileges and were permitted to elect their own magistrates. Immigrants from across the Greek world came in the thousands to Ptolemaic Egypt, seeing it as a land of opportunity where there were fortunes to be made in finance and commerce. But such immigrants, as immigrants tend to do, naturally gravitated to existing Greek communities. Alexandria, Naucratus, and Ptolemaeus rapidly became multi-ethnic polyglot cities, where Sicilians, Illyrians, and Thracians rubbed shoulders with Ionians and Carians. By contrast, large tracts of the Egyptian countryside, where the native population was dominant, remained relatively immune to immigration. This cultural and ethnic divide between the Greek cities and the Egyptian countryside ran like a fault line through Ptolemaic society. The Pharos may have been a beacon to a land of opportunity, but it was no statue of liberty. A small class of Greek officials, merchants, and soldiers ruled the roost, while the mass of Egyptian peasantry tilled the fields, as they had always done. The Ptolemies showed no hesitation in adopting the autocratic, authoritarian mode of rule. Perfected by their pharaonic predecessors, while entrusting the reins of power to a small Greek-speaking coterie of royal favorites. Out went the vizier, the head of the Egyptian administration since the dawn of history, to be replaced by a Dioikites. Under him, officials with similarly alien titles controlled every aspect of government, from the chief secretary, hypomnematographos, in Alexandria to the chief administrator, strategos, in each province, appointed by the king too. 
keep a close eye on the native population. The ruling class had their gymnasia, bastions of, male, Greek culture. These men wrote and spoke in Greek, and they continued to think of themselves as Greeks. Even after three or four generations in Egypt, they also had their own legal system, imported from their homeland. It operated alongside the native pharaonic system of courts that continued to decide cases. Between Egyptians, it was quite literally a case of one law for those in power, another law for the rest. In the towns and villages of rural Egypt, especially in the Fayum, with its concentration of Greek military settlers, the native population had no choice but to accommodate this new, alien culture in their midst. Many in the lower ranks of the bureaucracy adopted double names, using higher status Greek names in the exercise of their official duties but reverting to their Egyptian names for private matters. In a typical village, such as Kirkio Cyrus, Greek shrines dedicated to Zeus and the two heavenly twins, Castor and Pollux, jostled for space with native shrines, where people still worship the old deities Isis, Thoth, Bastet, and Amun. Even in Memphis, with its thriving port and its long tradition of cultural mixing, each ethnic group lived in a separate quarter of the city. The question for the Ptolemies was how to bind together such disparate elements into a unified kingdom, how to prevent the country from fragmenting along ethnic and cultural lines. The answer, as so often in Egyptian history, was religion. Animal cults had been a characteristic feature of ancient Egyptian religion for centuries, and Ptolemy I took great pains to honor them. He paid particular devotion to the most ancient and revered of all such cults, the Apis Bull of Memphis, not least because of its strong connection with divine kingship since the First Dynasty, to complement the bull's cult center. At Saqqara, Ptolemy I built a second complex at Alexandria, dedicated to Osiris Apis, Serapis in Greek. Pilgrims came from all over the Greek world to visit the two Serapiums. The native Egyptians, however, remained distinctly underwhelmed. They knew traditional deities when they saw them. Serapis, represented as a Greek hero. God, was not one of them. Eventually, the Ptolemaic state withdrew its funding for the cult of Serapis, having failed to win over the Egyptian population. Rather more successful was the Ptolemies' attempt to combine the Hellenistic and Egyptian concepts of monarchy into a single countrywide ruler cult. Alexander's life and death had demonstrated the potency of the Hellenistic version, and the Ptolemies understood the unifying force of Egyptian divine kingship, a doctrine that had been the country's defining belief for most of its history. Combining the two strands, Hellenistic and Pharaonic, seemed to promise a result that would be irresistible to both communities. At first, it was the Hellenistic cult of the Basileus, king, that took precedence. Ptolemy I deliberately promoted the cult of Alexander, associating himself with it and establishing it in Alexandria to give his dynasty legitimacy. He elevated his former boss to the position of state god and made Alexander's priest, an office denied to native Egyptians, the highest ranking clergyman in the land. Not that Ptolemy was overcome with modesty. When it came to self-deification, beyond the shores of the Delta, on the island of Rhodes, he was only too happy to be worshipped as a god. During his lifetime, after his death, he was formally deified in Egypt. And a festival in his honor, the Ptolemaea, was celebrated in Alexandria every four years, accompanied by processions, sacrifices, banquets, and sporting competitions. Ptolemy II went even further, founding cults for numerous members of his family, including his mistresses. His great procession of 275 to 274 proclaimed the material and military basis of his, Greek, kingship, and at the same time, he took steps to polish his credentials as pharaoh. Soon after his accession, he visited many of Egypt's most important sanctuaries, especially those devoted to the indigenous animal cults, to fulfill his religious duties as an Egyptian ruler. He had images of himself and members of his dynasty placed in the Serapeum at Saqqara, alongside the statues of the Apis Bull and other Egyptian gods. Above all, like all good pharaohs before him, he honored the gods by commissioning spectacular new temple buildings. A complex dedicated to Isis was begun on the island of Philae, at the first cataract. Work was also undertaken at Ipizit, Geb II, Greek Koptos, Ionet, 
Greek Tentyris, Saqqara, and in the delta at Perhebet, Greek Izium. The native temples were bastions of Egyptian culture, proudly independent institutions that made a point of rejecting external influences, as a way of maintaining pharaonic religion and customs. So, by acting the royal patron, in time-honored fashion, Ptolemy II hoped to reconcile the native population to foreign rule. The temples were also important landowners and centers of economic activity, so they offered the king material as well as spiritual gain. To tap into this vital source of wealth, Ptolemy forced the temple estates to accept crown agents, trusted officials who were tasked with looking after the government's economic interests. Egypt's famed wealth had always been based upon its agricultural productivity, and from the start, the Ptolemies were determined to exploit their new domain to the full. The founder of the dynasty established his eponymous city, Ptolemaeus, in an area renowned for its arable cultivation. He launched an even more ambitious project in the Fayum, reclaiming vast tracts through irrigation and troubling the region's cultivable land in the process. Under Ptolemy II, in a miracle of civil engineering, an artificial lake with a capacity of 360 million cubic yards was created in the southern Fayum. It held enough water to irrigate about 60 square miles of arable land. Because these estates had been created anew from barren desert, they lay outside any pre-existing land claims, and their produce was channeled straight into the state's ample coffers. Similarly, in every rural community throughout Egypt, the lowliest official in the government hierarchy, the village scribe, concerned himself first and foremost with land use and farm yields. His main task was to work out how much land could be rented out by the state to tenant farmers and how much revenue it would produce. Scribes were summoned to their provincial capital to meet with the Greek governor in the state records office twice a year, once in February, to prepare for the annual survey of agricultural production, and again four weeks later to report on the survey's findings. Later in the year, in the early summer, village scribes from across Egypt gathered in Alexandria to answer to the Dioikites. It was a stark reminder that, whether the country was ruled by an Egyptian or a Greek, the economy remained at the heart of the state's concerns. Like colonial rulers before and since, the Ptolemies were concerned with squeezing every drop of profit out of their territory, regardless of the consequences. They levied a land tax on Lower Egypt and a harvest tax on Upper Egypt, and charged high fees for holding government office. Even a village scribe had to pay a commission on appointment, and reappointment, and was compelled, as a condition of service, to lease land from the crown at a very high annual rent. Little by little, the state imposed a new economic regime throughout Egypt, turning ever more land over to wheat production using intermediaries to collect revenue, and maximizing taxation by every means possible. As a result, Ptolemaic Egypt outshone every other Hellenistic state in wealth and power. But these policies also bred instability and insurrection. Subservient in their own country, the native Egyptians would not stay silent and uncomplaining forever. Rebellion. The Ptolemies may have sought to project an image of divine authority, but their view of themselves as benevolent rulers was by no means universally shared. After only two generations of Greek rule, Elements of the Egyptian population decided to vent their frustration at the punitive economic policies imposed by their foreign masters. In 245, Ptolemy III was forced to break off his campaigning during the Third Syrian War to deal with a native revolt. It was a minor and short-lived insurrection but the harbinger of worse to come. Resentment festered for another three decades, kept at bay by the Ptolemy's machinery of repression. Ironically, the last straw was a famous military victory. In 217, after the Fourth Syrian War had been raging for two years, the forces of Ptolemaic Egypt and the Seleucid Kingdom reached a decisive moment and faced each other across the border near the town of Raphia. To finance the war effort, Ptolemy IV, 221-204, had increased taxes still further, imposing a heavy burden on an already hard-pressed population. He had also put aside the Ptolemies' long-standing contempt for non-Greek soldiers by recruiting a large force of Egyptian troops, albeit armed in Macedonian style. On the eve of battle he addressed his forces, acting the part of a traditional pharaoh, but the pretense fooled nobody, especially as he had to use an interpreter to translate from Greek into Egyptian. The Battle of Raphia resulted in a narrow Ptolemaic victory, and Ptolemy IV had himself immortalized on the walls of Egyptian temples as a war hero and ruler of Syria. Too it was the last time a Ptolemy would display such confidence in his own sovereignty. Armed and battle-hardened, the 20,000 Egyptian troops seized the opportunity to mutiny, feeding a widespread revolt throughout the delta. Peasants left their villages in droves and lived as outlaws, roaming the countryside. Bandits attacked a Greek garrison and an Egyptian temple, both symbols of repression. The Macedonian and Seleucid kings offered their assistance to Ptolemy IV, putting aside their dynastic rivalry in face of this native insurrection, but to little effect. Within a few years, civil war raged through Lower Egypt. 
Encouraged by the unrest in the north, the citizens of Thebes were the next to rebel. Ever since the fall of the New Kingdom, Upper Egypt in general and the Theban region in particular had harbored secessionist tendencies. The attitude of the Ptolemies, who rarely strayed beyond their northern power base, merely exacerbated Theban resentment at being ruled from distant Alexandria. Sensing the native threat, Ptolemy IV ordered construction to begin on a vast new temple to Horus at Jeba, Greek Apollonos Polis, in the far south of Egypt. But it was too little, too late. A contemporary text, the Demotic Chronicle, lambasted the Ptolemaic rulers, accusing them of ignoring Mot, and prophesied that a native king would rise up to overthrow the foreigners. The prophecy was soon fulfilled. In 206, a charismatic rebel leader won an initial victory against the state's forces. Within a few months, after taking the sacred city of Thebes, he was proclaimed pharaoh and given official recognition by the priesthood of Amun. Horwenifer, beloved of Amun Ra, king of the gods, began his reign in the autumn of 205. From Abju, in the north, to Inerti, Greek Pythiris, in the south, Upper Egypt was once again under native rule. Land records were destroyed, the hated tax regime was suspended, and Greeks were forced from their homes. Ptolemaic rule was in retreat. For a brief, heady moment, it looked as if the Nile Valley might wrest itself free from foreign domination, as it had at other turning points in its history. The Ptolemies thought otherwise. At the end of 200, a new king in Alexandria, Ptolemy V, 204 to 180, launched his counteroffensive. Greek troops marched southward from their bases in the Delta and the Fayum. By early 199 they had recaptured Ptolemaeus, and as summer turned to autumn they laid siege to the sacred site of Abju. Having seized the cult center of the god Osiris Wenifer from the rebel leader, they pressed on to Thebes, there to win a further victory. Pessimism among the freedom fighters turned to despair as they lost first their capital, then their leader. Poor Wenifer's death in mid-autumn 199 might have spelled the end of Theban resistance, but a successor, Anquenifer, quickly filled his shoes, continuing the same sequence of regnal years as if nothing had happened. However, with Ptolemaic forces in control of Thebes, and another major Greek garrison dug in at Aswan, Anquenifer's options were severely limited. Daringly, he chose to march northward, perhaps using the desert routes, and targeted the province of Saudi, Greek Lycopolis, 190 miles north of Thebes. By inflicting maximum damage, plundering towns, and disrupting the normal workings of the rural economy, Anquenifer's plan was to isolate the Ptolemaic troops occupying Thebes, deprive them of supplies, and cut their lines of communication with Alexandria. It was a bold move, and a successful one. Before long, the Ptolemaic army was forced to abandon Thebes and retreat southward. The rebel forces were back in the game. Frustrated by the degree of opposition in Upper Egypt, Ptolemy V decided to direct his firepower against the Delta rebels. In 197, his army besieged their fortified and well-stocked headquarters. In the end, the insurgents' idealism proved no match for the superior strength and weaponry of the Ptolemaic forces. The town was captured and the ringleaders of the uprising were brought to Memphis, there to suffer public execution by impalement as part of Ptolemy's coronation festivities. This highly charged occasion on March 26, 196, mixing politics and religion in characteristically Egyptian style, was duly commemorated in a great royal decree, inscribed in the country's two languages, Egyptian and Greek, and three scripts, hieroglyphics, demotic characters, and Greek. This decree of Memphis survives to this day, more famously known as the Rosetta Stone. Buoyed by his decisive victory in the Delta, Ptolemy V turned his attention, once again, to Thebes. First, the Ptolemaic army drove the rebel forces from the province of Saudi in a bloody battle that ravaged the land. Then, in the autumn of 191, Anquenifer abandoned Thebes and fled toward the Nubian border. His options were fast running out. Once back in control of Thebes, the authorities, ever concerned with economic matters, held a public auction of land confiscated from the insurgents. The sooner it was returned to profitable cultivation, the sooner the taxes would start to flow again. With Greek troops now converging on Aswan, well supplied with grain from all over Egypt, Anquenifer knew that his cause was doomed. Despite receiving military assistance from Nubia, the Egyptian rebels were finally defeated on August 27, 186. Anquenifer's son was killed in battle, he himself was captured and imprisoned. Only the intervention of a synod, held in Alexandria a few days later, spared him an excruciating death. The Egyptian priests managed to persuade Ptolemy V that killing Anquenifer would merely create a martyr and that a wiser policy would be to brand him an enemy of the gods but pardon him. The king swallowed hard, accepted the priest's counsel, and issued a great amnesty decree, instructing all fugitives to return to their homes and fields. 
In a further attempt to placate native sentiment, Ptolemy V lavished spending on the temples, resuming the work at Jiba that had been suspended at the outbreak of the insurgency in 206. Yet, hand in hand with these conciliatory gestures, he also took steps to impose absolute military control over the south. For the first time, loyalist Greek soldiers were given land grants in upper Egyptian communities. The governor resident in Ptolemaeus was given complete control of civil and military matters, and two new army camps were set up at strategic points near Thebes, at Sumenu, Greek Crocodilopolis, and Inerti. Future rebels would not have it so easy. Ptolemy V reserved his final act of vengeance for the remaining northern rebels who had started the revolt in the first place. In 185, on the pretext of seeking a negotiated settlement, he lured them to the city of Say, symbolic center of lower Egyptian resistance since the far-off days of Tefnacht more than five centuries earlier. Too late they realized the trap. On the king's orders, they were stripped naked, harnessed to carts like oxen, and forced to pull the carts through the city streets, watched by the city's terrified inhabitants, before being tortured to death. Ptolemaic mercy had its limits. The royal family's appetite for internecine rivalry did not. The internal crises affecting the dynasty grew increasingly serious from the late 3rd century onward, exacerbated by the persistent native rebellions. When Ptolemy V had come to the throne in 204, aged barely six, his mother, due to become regent, had been murdered by powerful court officials. They had then fought among themselves to gain the upper hand, weakening the government still further. Riven by conflict at home, the Ptolemaic state had been trounced abroad, losing its overseas possessions in Syria, Anatolia, and Thrace. By the time of Ptolemy V's death in 180, a once mighty empire was fatally weakened. And with Hellenistic power crumbling across the eastern Mediterranean, an ambitious young state was watching developments with hungry eyes. The road to Rome the Latins were one of a number of Italic tribes descended from settlers who had first migrated into Italy around the time of the Sea Peoples. In 753, according to their own tradition, the Latins had established a city by the banks of the river Tiber. This foundation, Rome, had grown steadily in size and influence until, by 338, it had controlled the surrounding province of Latium and within another 80 years the whole of peninsular Italy, ousting Greek colonists in the process. Little wonder that the Ptolemies had wanted to be on friendly terms. So in 273, following his great procession, flush with pride and more confident than ever of his own importance, Ptolemy II had taken the step of arranging a formal exchange of envoys with the rising star of international politics. The Treaty of Friendship with Rome was the beginning of a long, tortuous, and ultimately fatal attraction. From the outset, the Ptolemies regarded the Romans with a mixture of haughty condescension and sycophantic fascination, as is the one of established superpowers with up-and-coming nations. To curry favor with Rome, and despite having a treaty with the Phoenician city of Carthage, on the North African coast, Ptolemaic Egypt sat on its hands during the First Punic War, and received a delegation of grateful Romans as a reward for its duplicity. Playing the same game, Rome intervened in the endless struggles between the Ptolemaic Kingdom and its Macedonian and Seleucid rivals, posing as a friend of Egypt in order to further its own international ambitions. In such an atmosphere, the Hellenistic dynasty's bitter feuding led inevitably to the emergence of Rome as the key player in Mediterranean politics. Like his father, Ptolemy VI, 180-145, became king at the age of six. For the first four years of his reign, with his mother acting as regent, some degree of stability was maintained. But after her death in 176, those at court who backed the king's siblings broke cover and soon forced the proclamation of a triarchy. Ptolemy VI, his sister, and his younger brother Ptolemy VIII would henceforth reign as joint sovereigns. It was a recipe for disaster. A disastrous Sixth Syrian War, during which Ptolemy VI tried to negotiate terms with the enemy, led to his being deposed by the federal citizenry of Alexandria. The Seleucid king, Antiochus, claiming to represent Ptolemy VI, but interested only in a land grab of his own, besieged the Egyptian capital, before breaking off his campaign to deal with domestic problems. The situation was a typically Macedonian cocktail of sibling rivalry, territorial ambition, and native unrest. Enter the cool-headed Romans to restore order. When Antiochus moved against Alexandria again in the spring of 168, having already captured Cyprus and Memphis and begun issuing royal decrees as ruler of Egypt, Rome intervened decisively to prevent a unification of the Seleucid and Ptolemaic kingdoms. A few months later, in early July, the Roman envoy Popolius met Antiochus in a suburb of Alexandria called Eleusis. With show-stopping chutzpah, the envoy demanded an immediate cessation of hostilities and the complete withdrawal of Seleucid forces from Egypt and Cyprus without delay. Overawed, Antiochus meekly complied, and left with his tail between his legs. 
The day of Eleusis went down in history as the moment when Rome saved Egypt. It was a Faustian pact. For the remaining 130 years of Ptolemaic rule, Roman, not Greek, power was the key factor in the destiny of the Nile Valley. As family disputes between Ptolemy VI and his siblings wore out the kingdom, Rome was increasingly asked to intervene on one side or another, and the Romans strengthened their stranglehold on the country's fate. To make matters worse, opportunistic rebellions continued to break out in Upper Egypt, insurgents taking advantage of the power vacuum at the center. In 165, Thebes erupted in revolt. Serious clashes spread to the Fayum, where rebels burned land documents in a direct challenge to the authorities, farmers left their villages, and fugitives sought sanctuary in the temples. Ptolemy VI responded with a decree making leasing and cultivation of land compulsory, but the measure proved so ineffective and unpopular that he was forced to go into exile. It is not surprising that he headed straight for Rome. Ptolemy VIII fared no better. Within a year, his tyrannical rule led to calls for his brother's return and he found himself turning to Rome for support. Exiled in Cyrenaica, desperate to regain power, and unsettled by an attempt on his life in 156 to 155, Ptolemy VIII made a will promising his kingdom to Rome if he should die without a legitimate heir. It had the desired effect of frightening his political opponents, better the devil you know, they concluded, but it merely weakened Egyptian independence still further. Only with the death of Ptolemy VI in 145 did the younger brother finally regain his throne. On returning to Alexandria, Ptolemy VIII married his brother's widow, and his own sister, and it is said that he had her son by Ptolemy VI murdered during the wedding celebrations. It was entirely typical of his one in barbarity. He carried out harsh reprisals against the Jewish troop commanders who had risen up against his regime, and he banished many Greek intellectuals from Alexandria. As a counterbalance to the many enemies he was making among the immigrant population, Ptolemy VIII deliberately curried favor with his Egyptian subjects, patronizing their temples and issuing amnesty decrees. It was a shameless bribe, but it worked. Well used to brutal rulers, the native population turned a blind eye to Ptolemy's atrocities and rallied to his side. The dynasty's domestic affairs, never straightforward, then turned increasingly bizarre. Ptolemy began an intimate relationship with his sister-wife's younger daughter, marrying her in 141 and making her queen. As a result, mother and daughter became the fiercest of rivals. Those seeking to oust the despotic king could now count on his older wife's full support. When civil war broke out between the two camps in 132, Ptolemy fled to Cyprus, taking his younger consort with him and leaving his estranged wife to be acclaimed sole ruler in Alexandria. Fearing that his son by her would be proclaimed king, Ptolemy had the young boy kidnapped, brought to Cyprus, and murdered before his own eyes. He then dismembered the body and had the pieces sent back to the boy's mother to arrive on the eve of her birthday celebrations. Never one to put personal grief before political gain, she put the remains on public display in Alexandria, to arouse the people's wrath against the tyrant Ptolemy but the native Egyptian population remained steadfastly loyal. His cruel calculation had paid off. Ptolemy VIII's popularity among his Egyptian subjects gave him the perfect springboard, and he recaptured the country from his wife's backers. He further capitalized on his native support by promoting Egyptians to high office for the first time in two centuries. Men such as the royal scribe Wenifer spouted the same self-aggrandizing hyperbole as their predecessors from the golden age of Egyptian civilization, I was one honored by his father, praised by his mother, gracious to his brothers. I was one praised in his town, beneficent in his province, gracious to everyone. I was well disposed, popular, widely loved, cheerful. 3. But alongside the self-congratulation, there was an equal measure of dissipation that signaled the decay of pharaonic mores, I was a lover of drink, a lord of the feast day, singers and maidens gathered together, braided, beauteous, tressed, high-bosomed, they danced in beauty, doing my heart's wish. 4. Such decadence was a sign of the times. The people of Egypt were taking their cue from their rulers. Once Ptolemy VIII had retaken Alexandria, to teach his opponents a lesson he had the gymnasium surrounded and torched, burning everyone inside alive. Such senseless violence and the pursuit of power, combined with rampant corruption, only accelerated Egypt's decline. In the summer of 116, Ptolemy VIII breathed his last in Alexandria, leaving his throne to his young wife and whichever of her two sons she preferred. At the same time, 700 miles upstream, a group of Romans came to visit the temple of Isis at Philae and carved their names on the temple wall, leaving behind the oldest surviving Latin inscriptions in Egypt. The two incidents nicely summed up the past and future of the Nile Valley. The dynastic strife of an old and tired regime looked increasingly irrelevant in the face of Roman expansionism. Twenty years later, Rome inherited Cyrenaica, leaving Cyprus as the only overseas Ptolemaic possession.
history repeated itself as two royal brothers, Ptolemy 9 and 10, vied for power and there was further unrest in Upper Egypt. A second Ptolemy willed his kingdom to Rome and returned for military support, and there were more outrages in the capital. Of all the old certainties that had given Egypt its self-confidence, only a belief in the traditional gods remained. For that reason, if for no other, great were the celebrations in 70 when the vast new temple of Horus at Jeba was finally consecrated, 167 years after Ptolemy III had performed the foundation ceremony. Thoroughly Ptolemaic in design but undeniably pharaonic in dedication, the towering edifice of sandstone, with its pylon gateways and columned halls, was the epitome of the hybrid Hellenistic Egyptian culture that successive generations of Greek pharaohs had struggled to create. The crowds who gathered that day to enjoy the colorful pageantry must have hoped, in their heart of hearts, that they were witnessing a new dawn, a promise of future harmony and prosperity. Similar sentiments, no doubt, accompanied the birth a few months later of the king's newest child. Of mixed ancestry, Ptolemy XII's baby daughter carried on her tiny shoulders the hopes and expectations of her diverse countrymen. Her life would be devoted to maintaining their independence, her death would signal the end of pharaonic Egypt. Her name was Cleopatra. Chapter 24 Finis Credit Crunch From the beginning of Egyptian history, the high priest of Ptah had been one of the most important men in the kingdom. Since the unification of the country, Memphis had been the national capital, and Ptah was the city's principal deity. So Ptah's chief officiant was in the very top echelon of clergy, one of a handful of high priests responsible for guarding Egypt's revered religious traditions. In theory, the high priest of Ptah, or the greatest of craftsmen, to give him his ancient and esoteric formal title, was a royal appointee. But the notion of the royal prerogative had a habit, throughout Egyptian history, of conflicting with the even more deeply ingrained hereditary ideal, whereby fathers pass their offices to their sons. So it was that, under the Ptolemies, the top job in the Memphit priesthood had been held by a single family, son succeeding father in unbroken succession for more than 260 years. As generation followed generation, the high priests of Ptah skillfully combined hereditary office with ultra-loyalty to the sovereign, to become the most powerful and influential native family in the land. In the great southern city of Thebes, once the religious capital of the Egyptian empire, the high priests of Amun had displayed lukewarm enthusiasm toward their Greek rulers. Not so the high priests of Ptah, who had been resolute supporters of the Ptolemies, eagerly bestowing the stamp of divine authority in return for royal favor. Their southern compatriots may have regarded such collaboration with disgust, but in truth nothing could have been more Egyptian. At the time of Cleopatra's birth in 69, greatest of craftsmen Pasharemta had more cause than most of his ancestors to support the regime. Succeeding to the high priesthood at the age of 15, he had dutifully crowned Cleopatra's father, Ptolemy XII, as one of his first official acts. He remained a member of the king's trusted inner circle, and could boast with only a touch of hyperbole of having been born e g Egypt's sovereign. One for the forty years after Cleopatra's birth, the fortunes of the two individuals, Pasharemta and Cleopatra, would be closely intertwined. Priest and princess, their lives and fates chart the final chapter in the long history of ancient Egypt. From the moment of her birth, Cleopatra was regarded as a semi-divine being. Her royal father had been hailed as the new Dionysus, or, for his Egyptian subjects, the young Osiris, and the long-standing royal cult of the Ptolemies had effectively made him a god on earth. The Egyptian clergy, with Pasharemta as their cheerleader, saw no difficulty in accepting and supporting the divinity of the first family, since it had been one of the central tenets of pharaonic religion since the dawn of history. But the reign of Ptolemy XII was no golden age, quite the reverse. Instead of growing rich from agricultural bounty and foreign trade, Ptolemy XII presided over an abrupt and precipitous decline in the nation's fortunes. It all came down to protection money. Egypt had long ceased to be a major power in the eastern Mediterranean. Of the once extensive Ptolemaic lands, only Cyprus remained within the fold, ruled by Ptolemy's brother. The Mediterranean had a new power, Rome, determined to extend the frontiers of its nascent empire. In the face of such a ruthless and well-armed opponent, nations had only two options, resist and be eliminated, or collaborate. Ptolemaic Cyrenaica had already fallen to the Romans in 75, and Ptolemy had no intention of letting Egypt go the same way. Getting into bed with the enemy was the lesser of two evils. For its part, Rome was like a lion on the hunt, it could sense weakness in its quarry, and lost no time in moving in for the kill. The legal will of Ptolemy X, which had seemed to promise the Nile Valley to Rome, provided the Romans with the perfect excuse for extorting revenues from what was still the richest country in the region. For its part, Egypt had no choice. It was a question of pay up, or else. When Princess Cleopatra was a mere toddler of four years, this stark reality came into sharp focus. 
far away in the Roman Senate, the Republic's political leaders, as competitive and disputatious as ever, began to use Egypt as a tool to further their own ambitions. In 65, Crassus proposed the formal annexation of the Nile Valley as a Roman province, a move vigorously opposed by Cicero as detrimental to the stability of the Republic. Temporarily thwarted, the hawks on the Capitoline Hill turned their attention instead toward an easier prey, the Seleucid Kingdom of Western Asia. At a stroke, the Ptolemy's old rival in the Near East was liquidated by the armies of Pompey the Great and absorbed into the Roman realm. Anxious to back a winner, Ptolemy XII responded to this momentous development by sending 8,000 cavalry to support Pompey's further expansion into Palestine. No matter that his extravagant gesture of goodwill exhausted the crown revenues, forcing tax rises and cuts in public expenditure, and stirring up a minor revolt. Keeping on the right side of Rome was now the number one priority, irrespective of the domestic repercussions. Pompey looked on with customary Roman hauteur, refusing even to help Ptolemy put down the insurrection that the tax rises provoked. Egypt should have learned its lesson from this unhappy episode, but its naive foreign policy seemed to have a momentum of its own. As the country became progressively indebted to its bullyboy protector, the Egyptian population came to hate the Romans and everything associated with them. It did not augur well for the Ptolemaic dynasty. To make matters worse, Rome had two rival strongmen. Buying off. Pompey was not enough, since Julius Caesar was equally powerful. The devil had two faces, both needed appeasing. When in 59 Caesar threatened to raise the Egyptian question once more in the Senate. Ptolemy resorted to his favored strategy. He paid protection money, equal to half of Egypt's annual revenue, in return for official recognition. As king of Egypt and a friend and fellow of the Roman people. Amicus et socius populi Romani. Not that it did him much good. Barely a year later, as Ptolemy celebrated the marriage of his close confidant the high priest Pasharenta to a 14-year-old bride, his newfound friends went ahead and annexed Cyprus, driving its king, Ptolemy's brother, to commit suicide. Joy thus turned to sorrow within. A matter of months, but Ptolemy kept quiet, for fear of angering Rome. The pharaoh was now bankrupt morally as well as financially. It was all too much for the proud and passionate citizens of Alexandria, who rose up and ousted their craven king, forcing him into exile. A dejected Ptolemy went first to Rhodes, to kowtow before the Roman magistrate who had just accepted the Cypriot surrender. In the ultimate humiliation, Ptolemy was ushered in to see Marcus Portius Cato while the latter was on the toilet after a particularly effective dose of laxative. In the days of old, the pharaoh had been accustomed to grinding foreigners underfoot, now he was less significant than a barbarian's bowel movements. There was no farther to fall. Yet, far from seeking a way out of its imperiled position, the Ptolemaic dynasty continued to behave as before, ever the author of its own ruin. In Alexandria, the throne was offered first to Ptolemy's wife. And then, after her untimely death, to Ptolemy's eldest daughter. Berenica. A woman ruling alone was anathema to the Greeks, so attempts began immediately to find her a suitable husband. But, Berenica was as recalcitrant and bloodthirsty as her ancestors. The first suitor died en route, the second was stopped at the border by the Romans, the third made it to Alexandria but was strangled after a few days when his bride-to-be declared herself fatally unimpressed. From Rhodes, Ptolemy wound his way to Ephesus and thence to Rome, arriving in 57 and staying for two years. During that time, he acted the archetypal dictator in exile, ordering the liquidation of his domestic opponents while living it up in foreign villas. Eventually, he clinched the deal he had come for. In exchange for a sum of 10,000 talents, equal to Egypt's entire annual income, and borrowed from a banker named Rubirius, who could scarcely believe his fortune, Ptolemy would be restored to his throne by Gabinius, the Roman governor of Syria. On April 15, 55, with Gabinius's army at his side, Ptolemy marched into Alexandria, reclaimed his kingdom, executed his daughter Berenica, and named Rubirius as his new finance minister. Egypt was not just in Rome's pocket, it was now effectively a provincial branch of the Roman central bank. For Ptolemy XII, restoration equaled utter humiliation. Friends, Romans, countrymen. During his two years of enforced exile in Rome, Ptolemy XII seems to have received comfort and reassurance from a particularly beloved 
Companion. There is evidence that he took one of his daughters with him on his travels to Rhodes, Ephesus, and Rome, and while her identity cannot be proven with certainty, Cleopatra is the most likely candidate. For the princess had just turned eleven at the time of her father's ousting, old enough to travel, young enough to be allowed out of Egypt without posing a threat to her elder sister Berenica. If Cleopatra did indeed spend her preteen years in Rome, she learned valuable lessons from the experience. No Ptolemaic ruler could afford to pander entirely to Roman wishes, but nor could Roman might be ignored. Keeping one's throne while preserving national sovereignty required the deftest of footwork on the narrowest of tightropes. Cleopatra would soon find herself walking it alone. Soon after his return from Rome, Ptolemy moved to shore up his position among the priesthood and the native population at large. Since the time of Narmer, kings had burnished their credentials and bolstered their authority by beautifying the gods' shrines and going on. Tours of inspection. Nearly three millennia later, Ptolemy XII saw no reason to depart from accustomed practice. He therefore ordered construction to commence on a vast new temple to the goddess. Hathor, at Ayunet, in Upper Egypt, the foundation stone was duly laid on. July 16, 54. At the same time, Ptolemy carried out an official visit to Memphis, accompanied by the leading representative of the native aristocracy, Pasharemta, high priest of Ptah. Both acts were a deliberate show of traditional pharaonic power, and Ptolemy took a further step to secure his dynasty by appointing Cleopatra as his formal co-region in 52. After nearly three decades on an uneasy throne, perhaps he sensed his days were numbered. On March 7, 51. A solar eclipse over Egypt was widely interpreted as a portent of doom. A few days later, Ptolemy XII was dead, and Cleopatra was proclaimed ruler of Egypt. She was just 17. In accordance with her father's will, she shared the throne with the elder of her two brothers, the ten-year-old Ptolemy XIII, while Rome was appointed as their official protector. Like most of the Ptolemies, previous dynastic arrangements, it was a disaster in the making. At first, Cleopatra tried to go it alone, sidelining her co-regent brother and ruling single-handedly for the first 18 months of their reign. But a series of natural and political disasters soon turned the public mood against her. In the summer of 50, an unusually low inundation led to crop failure and widespread food shortages. Cleopatra had to enact emergency legislation to prevent outright famine. A pharaoh's first and foremost responsibility was to placate the gods and ensure the continued prosperity of Egypt, for the gods to have deserted Cleopatra. So early in her reign was a profoundly worrying development. She compounded her growing unpopularity by bowing to a request to deport some fugitives who had fled Syria after murdering the sons of the Roman governor. By sending them back to their deaths, she confirmed the native Egyptians' worst fears about Rome's unstoppable rise. The tide of opinion now began to turn rapidly against Cleopatra and in favor of her brother. In the midst of all this domestic turmoil, Cleopatra also had to contend with unwelcome developments abroad. Rome's two military strongmen, Pompey and Caesar, were now embroiled in a bitter civil war. To pay back old debts, Cleopatra sided with Pompey, whose close ally, Gabinius, had restored Ptolemy XII to his throne. But even an alliance with a foreign warlord could not protect her from the wrath of her own people. In the early months of 48, like her father before her, Cleopatra was forced into exile. However, instead of going with cap in hand to Rome, she decided to raise an army closer to home, in her still loyal province of Palestine. By the late summer, two opposing armies, one backing Cleopatra, the other her brother, faced each other in the eastern Nile Delta. Ptolemy XIII, who had already won recognition by Rome as sole pharaoh, must have felt the more confident of the two siblings. But, when Pompey fled to Egypt on August 9, 48, after suffering a crushing defeat by Caesar in Greece, Ptolemy's confidence turned to recklessness. He watched nonchalantly from the harborside at Alexandria as Pompey was ferried ashore and promptly stabbed too. 
death by one of Pompey's own officers, now in Ptolemy's pay, before. He could even set foot on Egyptian soil. If Ptolemy had thought that. Killing Caesar's sworn enemy would win him friends, he was sorely. Mistaken. When Caesar himself arrived in Alexandria four days later. To be presented with Pompey's severed and pickled head, he reacted. Furiously to this savage treatment of a fellow Roman general. He. Marched straight to the royal palace, set up residence, and summoned. Ptolemy XIII to meet him. Sensing the importance of the moment, with. Pompey dead, Caesar was now the undoubted ruler of Rome. Cleopatra seized her chance. Evading detection by her brothers. Guards, she made her way to Alexandria and smuggled herself into the palace to join the audience with Caesar. In the humid heat of a mid-August day, in the royal quarter of Alexandria, the legendary meeting took place, the 21-year-old Ptolemaic queen and the 52-year-old Roman general. With her long, aquiline nose and pointed chin, she was not particularly attractive by modern standards. Battle-worn and weather-beaten, Hugh is hardly in the prime of life. But beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And power is a proven aphrodisiac. The chemistry worked. To the disgust and disbelief of Ptolemy XIII and his supporters. Caesar threw his weight behind Cleopatra and her claim to the throne. Of Egypt. Ptolemy's army besieged the palace while his Alexandrine. Allies proclaimed Cleopatra's younger sister Arsinoe queen in her. Place. Events then moved swiftly. In March 47, Roman reinforcements arrived to liberate Caesar and Cleopatra from their palace prison. Fierce fighting ensued, during which Ptolemy was drowned in the Nile. With her rival out of the way, Cleopatra was restored to the throne with her eleven-year-old brother, yet another Ptolemy, as her co-regent. And Cyprus was returned to Egypt as a further gesture of support by Rome. Arsinoe was taken captive and deported to Italy. Caesar and Cleopatra sailed up the Nile to celebrate their triumph. Although the accompanying flotilla of 400 Roman troop ships hardly gave the Egyptian populace much cause for celebration. Cleopatra had won, but Egypt had lost. The three Roman legions now stationed permanently in the Nile Valley were a testament to that. As Caesar remarked in his later account, he an occupying army was not Caesar's only legacy to Egypt. In the summer of 47, after he had left to continue his campaigning, Cleopatra gave birth to a boy. In no doubt about his paternity, she named him Ptolemy Caesar. At her command, the Cyprus Mint issued special commemorative coins to celebrate the arrival of the royal baby. Decorated with the double cornucopia, they proclaimed the abundance and promise of the Romano-Egyptian Union. Another birth to different parents, a year later, was the cause of equal celebration and thanksgiving. This time, both father and mother were present to share the joy. The happy parents were the high priest. Pasharenta and his wife of twelve years, Timhotep. Their delight at the birth of a son was all the greater because of the anguish that had preceded it. In the early years of their marriage, Timhotep had borne her husband three healthy children, but they had all been daughters. In ancient Egypt, every man wished for a male heir, the more so when he was the high priest of Ptah and the hereditary holder of an office that had been in his family for eleven generations. By the time he turned. 43, Pasharemta must have begun to wonder if he would die. Without a successor. In desperation, his wife turned to the trusty native. Gods, in particular, to Imhotep. The courtier of Netariket who had. Lived twenty-six centuries earlier, at the dawn of the Pyramid Age, and. Whose crowning achievement, the Steppe Pyramid, still rose majestically. On the Memphite skyline, was worshipped throughout Egypt as a god of wisdom, magic, and medicine. His cult was especially strong in Memphis, and Timhotep herself, as a daughter of the city, carried his name. If any of the gods would answer the couple's prayers for a son, surely Imhotep would. So, Timhotep prayed together with the high priest to the majesty of the god great in wonders, effective in deeds. Who gives a son to him who has none, Imhotep, son of Ptah. 3. Wondrously, the prayer was answered. Imhotep appeared to her in a dream, promising her a son if she would arrange for his memphit. Shrine to be beautified, you scratch my back, and I'll scratch yours. It helped that Timhotep's husband was perhaps the most influential.
man in Memphis and head of the local priesthood. The builders, painters, and decorators must have completed their work in record. Time. On July 15, 46, at around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Timehotep gave birth to the longed for son. There was jubilation over him by the people of Memphis. He was given the name Imhotep and was also called Patibastet. Everyone rejoiced over him. 4. For Timehotep, the birth of a son was the culmination of her wifely duties. For Cleopatra, her son's birth had a deeper, religious significance. To mark the birth of her Caesarian, little Caesar, the queen consecrated a roof shrine at Ayunet, a temple dedicated appropriately, to the ancient mother goddess Hathor. At Ioni, Greek. Hermonthus, she built a birth house to celebrate the institution of divine procreation. In Ptolemaeus and Alexandria, the two great Greek cities of Egypt, she actively promoted the cult of Isis, already one of the most popular Egyptian deities and now a goddess with whom Cleopatra felt a special affinity. 4. In popular belief, Isis was a divine mother and protector, caring for her worshippers as she did for her infant son Horus. It was not difficult to draw the parallels. The royal propaganda of the time encouraged the association, and statues deliberately blended the iconography of Isis with the features of Cleopatra. Goddess and queen were becoming one. Cleopatra certainly had more credibility as an Egyptian deity than her forebears, since, unlike every previous Ptolemy, she seems to have taken the trouble to learn the native language. She evidently considered Egypt to be her home, and took pains to honor the traditional cults. She adopted a feminine version of the earliest and purest expression of divine kingship, the Horus title, and at least some of her Egyptian subjects viewed her as a fully legitimate pharaoh. All the stranger, then, that at the height of her popularity she should have left Egypt to travel to Rome as Caesar's guest when he finally returned home from campaigning in 46. For two years, she stayed in his estate. Across the Tiber, the relationship between them was the subject of much gossip, not least when Caesar dedicated a gold statue of Cleopatra in the Roman shrine of Venus Genetrix. His subsequent preparation of a bill, to be put before the Senate, to allow him to marry bigamously, outside Italy, have children with a foreign wife, and create a second capital city seemed to confirm the Romans' worst fears. Under the malign influence of an oriental queen, their war hero was going native. The assassination of Caesar on March 15, 44, put paid to his exotic ambitions. Within a month, Cleopatra left Rome and returned home to Alexandria. Another month later, her brother and co-ruler, Ptolemy XIV, was conveniently dead. In his place, Cleopatra elevated Caesarian II. The throne is Ptolemy XV, the father and mother-loving God. In Cleopatra's mind, the parallels between her own life and the life of the God seemed to grow stronger by the year. Caesar had been murdered, just like Osiris, his son and heir Caesarian was the new Horus. As for the widowed mother, Cleopatra, no one could now doubt her transformation into the living Isis. Dangerous liaisons. If Cleopatra had achieved apotheosis, her fellow members of the Pantheon were not impressed. Indeed, the gods seemed to have deserted. Egypt. A further series of low Niles in 43-41 led to more food. Shortages. In the big cities and in the countryside, the Egyptians felt increasingly desperate. Hard-pressed and hungry, they ceased even to look forward to the promise of a more comfortable afterlife. Imagining the hereafter as a continuation of their earthly lot, they turned their backs on 2,000 years of faith and began to dread what lay beyond the grave. Nobody expressed this fear of death more movingly. Then time Hotep. On February 15, 42, at the age of 30, she died. Leaving her husband, son, and three daughters to mourn. As befitted the wife of a high priest, her funerary stella was beautifully fashioned. From a slab of fine pale limestone, carved by the country's finest craftsmen. On its face, underneath a winged sun disc, a delicately carved frieze showed Timhotep worshipping the cream of Egypt's traditional deities, Anubis, god of mummification, Horus, son of Osiris, Nephthys and Isis, 
Osiris's sisters and chief mourners, the sacred Apis, bull of Memphis, and, finally, Sakar Osiris, god of the dead. If the divine lineup recalled Egypt's traditional self-confidence, the accompanying inscription, in 21 lines of finely cut hieroglyphs, embodied the new, darker zeitgeist. Tanhotep's funerary inscription is the longest and most heartfelt. Lament from ancient Egypt, a poignant assertion that the old certainties had well and truly disappeared. For the country as a whole, as well as for its individual citizens, the future looked ominous. With the murder of Caesar, Egypt had lost its protector. It was anybody's guess how his killers on the one hand and his heirs on the other would now behave toward Cleopatra and her realm. To make matters worse, her younger sister Arsinoe, freed from captivity in Rome and now living at Ephesus, provided a natural focus for dissenters within the Ptolemaic lands. Cleopatra's medal was tested to the full as first Cassius and then Mark Antony and Octavian sought military assistance from Egypt. Deploying all her political acumen, she read the situation correctly and threw her lot in with Caesar's allies. Antony's subsequent victory over Cassius and Brutus at the Battle of Philippi vindicated her decision. Egypt was saved, for the moment, but the country's reprieve came at a price. Its unforeseen, and ultimately tragic, consequence was Cleopatra's entanglement with a second Roman war hero. She may have met Antony for the first time in 55, when he came to Egypt as a young cavalry officer with Gabinius's army. Antony and Cleopatra must surely have come into contact again during her two-year stay in Rome in 46-44. It was to be a case of third time lucky. In the summer of 41, following the Entente between Egypt and Caesar's heirs, Antony summoned Cleopatra to meet him at Tarsus, in southeastern Anatolia. With the wind in his sails after Philippi, Antony had set his sights on defeating the Parthian Empire, Rome's last major enemy in Asia. To mount such a campaign he required a forward base in the eastern Mediterranean, and Egypt was ideal. For her part, Cleopatra was in urgent need of a new protector. Mutual advantage. Thus brought the two together. With her instinctive skills of presentation and propaganda, Cleopatra turned a diplomatic and political summit into a religious spectacle, arriving by river in the guise of Aphrodite slash Isis coming to meet her divine consort, Dionysus. Antony must have been flattered by the analogy, and beguiled by a queen fourteen years his junior. Like Caesar before him, he offered Cleopatra his support in return for her favors. Not even the news of Pasharemta's death, on July 14, could cool her ardor. Toward the end of the year, Antony and Cleopatra returned together to Alexandria. Nine months later, their twins were born, Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene, the sun and the moon. Fitting issue for a match made in heaven. Except that it wasn't. No sooner had the twins come into the world than their father upped and left Egypt. Returning to Rome, he sealed a deal with his great rival by marrying Octavian's sister, Octavia, and spurning Cleopatra. As for the Queen of Egypt, she should have learned from bitter experience that a whirlwind romance with a Roman general meant life as a single mother. For the next three years, with Antony off the scene, Egypt enjoyed a brief respite from the wearying succession of wars, intrigues, coups, and countercups that had plagued it under the Ptolemies' wayward rule. Imhotep, though only a boy of seven, was appointed high priest of Ptah in succession to his father and forefathers. The Nile inundation returned to accustomed levels, and agricultural production increased. If it had not been for the staggering levels of foreign debt, a legacy of Ptolemy XII's reign, Egypt's economy might have returned to prosperity. As it was, the government coffers were running on empty. Silver coinage was debased from 90% to 40% precious metal, before virtually disappearing from circulation. In its place, most coins were minted in bronze. Egypt's legendary wealth was going straight into Roman pockets restless to subdue Parthia and win himself even greater renown, by the autumn of 37 Antony had come to the conclusion that Octavian was not going to assist him. Egypt once again seemed the likeliest ally. So, he traveled east once more, to Antioch, and called a second summit. Meeting with Cleopatra.
As a sweetener, Antony gave her the contents. Of the great library of the kings of Pergamum, set to number two. Hundred thousand volumes, partial compensation for the holdings of. The Alexandrian library destroyed a decade earlier during Caesar's. War against Pompey. Antony also allocated Egypt a host of Roman. Territories around the eastern Mediterranean. This allowed Cleopatra. To pose as an imperialist pharaoh, a ruler who had restored some of. The luster to her forebears once great empire. To mark this. Renaissance, she introduced a system of double dating, proclaiming. Her sixteenth year on the throne the first year of a new era. But it was all. A mirage. The eastern lands were not Antony's to give. Phony title. Deeds and a collection of books in return for real troops and supplies. Was hardly a fair exchange. In the far-off days of the 18th dynasty, Egypt had been respected and feared as the mighty bull of Asia, now, it was Rome's milk cow. Due to a combination of poor preparation and overconfidence. Antony's first Parthian campaign was a complete disaster. In the space of a few months, he lost a third of his legionaries and nearly half his cavalry to a fierce and determined opponent. The only good news. That year was the birth of another son by Cleopatra, Ptolemy. Philadelphus. A second Parthian campaign in 34 saw Cleopatra travel. With Antony to the banks of the Euphrates. This time, Antony won a limited victory over Armenia, celebrated with quite disproportionate pomp in the donations of Alexandria. Before an enormous crowd. Antony and Cleopatra appeared together on silver thrones, she in the guise of Isis. He then boldly proclaimed their children to be the rulers of Rome's eastern provinces. To Cleopatra and Caesarian would be given the traditional Ptolemaic lands of Egypt, Cyprus, and Cyrenaica. Together with Coel Syria, Alexander Helios, attired for the occasion in Persian dress, would be given Armenia, Media, and Parthia. Ignoring the inconvenient fact that the last remained unconquered. While the two-year-old Ptolemy Philadelphus, dressed in Macedonian garb, received the provinces of Phoenicia, Syria, and Cilicia. Southeastern Anatolia. The boys were hailed as kings of kings. Destined to rule over the entire eastern empire. It was a complete pipe dream. By acquiescing in it and siding so. Publicly with Antony, Cleopatra was risking the wrath of Rome, whose Senators and citizens took a particularly dim view of Orientalist. Fantasies. The end of the affair. A remarkable document on papyrus sums up Egypt's rapid decline in the last. Tragic years of Cleopatra's reign. Dated February 23, 33, it records an. Egyptian royal decree granting extraordinary tax privileges to a Roman. General. Not just any general, but Antony's right-hand man, Publius. Canidius. Cleopatra's edict gave him permission to export ten thousand sacks of wheat from Egypt, not for nothing was the country called the breadbasket of the Roman Empire, and import five thousand amphorae of wine each year, duty-free. If that were not enough, Canidius was also exempt from all tax on his Egyptian landholdings, as were his tenants. In effect, he was declared to be outside the normal tax system. As a political bribe, it must rank as one of the biggest and boldest in history. The decree was addressed to a high-ranking government official in Alexandria, whose job it was to notify other bureaucrats in the administration. To give the measures. Effect, the Greek word genisthoi, make it happen, was added at the bottom of the papyrus. It may just be in Cleopatra's hand. If so, she was not so much passing a tax measure as signing her own death. Warrant. During the course of 33, it had become obvious for a second time. That the Roman realm was not big enough for two leaders. Antony, with the eastern provinces at his disposal and friends in the Senate, looked the better bet. But Octavian, Julius Caesar's great-nephew and legal heir, was equally determined. As with Caesar and Pompey 16. Years earlier, the clash of two mighty egos led all too readily to civil war. Cleopatra's close identification with Antony made it easy for Octavian to brand her as public enemy number one, using her to create a distinction between himself, the true Roman, and Antony, the dissolute traitor. No matter that Cleopatra's co-regent, Ptolemy XV, Caesarian, was Caesar's own son. In Octavian's eyes, she stood
conveniently for everything that was alien and detrimental to Rome's interests. Her fate, and the fate of Egypt, now rested on the outcome of Rome's internal conflict. As the feud between the two Roman factions intensified, Cleopatra and Antony sailed from Alexandria with an armada of 200 Egyptian ships. After stopping at Ephesus and Samos, they finally reached Athens. There, Antony publicly repudiated Octavia and cut all ties with his rival's camp. When winter gave way to the milder weather of spring 31, formal hostilities broke out. It soon became apparent that Antony's delusions of grandeur were not matched by his tactical ability. By the beginning of September, his land forces were pinned down in western Greece and his warships were blockaded in a large bay. A naval breakout under fire seemed the only remaining option. The Battle of Actium, on September 2, 31st, was more a flight than a military spectacle. Antony and Cleopatra escaped with their lives and 60 of their 230 ships. He fled to Libya, she to Alexandria. History had taught her that defeated leaders usually did not last long. So she took pains to dress her ships as if she had been victorious. When Antony joined her in the royal palace a few days later, the two of them tried hard to create an impression of normality. A huge festival was organized to celebrate Caesarian's coming of age, royal spectacles always being guaranteed crowd pleasers and welcome. Distractions from bad news. On a more mundane level, the wheels of the administration continued to grind, government edicts to be issued, and taxes collected, unless you were Canidius. In the Upper Egyptian town of Geb II, a guild of linen manufacturers drew up a detailed contract with two local priests to provide for the expenses of the local bull cult, bureaucracy and animal worship, a quintessentially Egyptian combination. To some, pharaonic civilization must have seemed immortal, impregnable. But beneath the public display of business as usual, Cleopatra was making feverish preparations for permanent exile. She had the remains of her naval fleet hauled over land from the Nile to the Red Sea, intending to send Caesarian away to India. But the local Nabataean Arabs literally burned her boats, and she found herself trapped in Alexandria with no escape route. As Octavian closed in from Syria and another of his divisions closed in from Cyrenaica. Cleopatra sent him a desperate embassy, offering to abdicate in favor of her children if he would only spare Egypt. Octavian did not reply. On July 29, 30, the high priest of Ptah, Imhotep, died at age 16. Years and three weeks. He was the casual to either of a weak constitution or, more likely, of a foe determined to eradicate all vestiges of Ptolemaic rule. For three centuries his forebears had successfully safeguarded Egypt's ancient religious traditions, the country's very soul. No more. Three days later, on August 1, Egypt fell to the might of Rome, as Octavian's forces bore down on Alexandria. By land and sea, Antony led his own army and navy through the city's gates for one last battle. But, after years of campaigning, he was a spent force. Antony was comprehensively defeated and, as Octavian entered the city, Cleopatra fled to her fortified treasury Camosoleum in the royal quarter of Alexandria. Subsequent events have passed into legend. Misinformed that his lover had already taken her own life, Antony fell on his sword. At Cleopatra's anguished insistence, his weak and almost lifeless body was hoisted up into her apartment, where he expired at her side. She in turn was tricked into leaving the building and promptly incarcerated in the royal palace. Just ten more golden sunsets over Alexandria and, on August 12, the last queen of Egypt followed her Roman paramour to the grave. In her comparatively short but turbulent life, she had seen one of her sisters overthrown and killed, another paraded as a Roman trophy. Suicide must have seemed a better ending than being lynched or than living the rest of her life in captivity. Whether it was an asp hidden in a basket of figs or a poison comb, the truth about the manner of her. Death no one knows. 6. Cleopatra died. Her memory lived on. Four centuries later, a worshipper still lovingly tended her cult statue in Rome. 20. Centuries later, recreations of her life and loves gripped the Western world. She is still with us. So, too, is her world. In the centuries since her death, 
the Nile Valley, has been fought over by Romans and Arabs, Christians and Muslims. The unrelenting Egyptian sun has bleached the gods once gaudy. Temples into romantic sand-colored tumble-down ruins. Tombs have been stripped of their treasures, pyramids of their shimmering capstones. But the allure of pharaonic civilization, embodied in the Western consciousness by its last queen, has proved altogether more resilient. In physical terms, Cleopatra's enduring monument, her most extravagant architectural legacy, is the Temple of Hathor at Ayunet. From its porticoed facade, the benign half-human, half-bovine face of the ancient mother goddess still peers down in concerned protection, as it has for two thousand years, as it did over the graven image of Narmer, Egypt's first king, at the dawn of pharaonic history. The iconography and ideology of divine kingship, arguably the ancient Egyptians' greatest inventions, were there at the end, just as they were. At the very beginning as heir to this extraordinarily ancient tradition, Cleopatra wished. Above all, for her dynasty to have a future. On the rear wall of the temple, she was depicted side by side with her son Ptolemy the Fifteenth, Caesarian, making offerings to the gods as her royal forebears had done for three millennia. If she was Isis Hathor, the Divine Mother, he would be Horus, the avenging son of a murdered father who would rise in glory and rule Egypt as a great king. As with so many of Cleopatra's hopes, fate had other ideas. Caesarian was eliminated by Octavian within days of Alexandria's fall. There would be no future for the Ptolemaic dynasty, for any dynasty of pharaohs. Yet alongside the last, bold assertion of divine kingship, the stones of Cleopatra's monument proclaim a deeper, more enduring truth. Next, to the figure of the very last Ptolemy are carved four simple hieroglyphs, a sandal strap, a snake, a loaf of bread, and a stretch of alluvial land. The quintessence of pharaonic civilization. Together they form an epithet that had been applied to kings since time immemorial. Ankhjet, living forever. It is a fitting epitaph, not just for Cleopatra but for ancient Egypt. Epilogue. The death of Cleopatra delivered Egypt into the hands of Rome, just as she had feared. With her demise, the proud 3,000-year-old tradition of pharaonic independence was snuffed out, once and for all. And Egypt became the personal property of a foreign emperor, to be plundered at will. For the next four centuries, Augustus and his successors exploited Egypt's fabled wealth to serve their own interests. Grain ships from Alexandria fed Rome's teeming population. Gold from the eastern desert filled the imperial coffers, vast columns and architraves of stone were hewn from the Red Sea hills to adorn public buildings in the Roman Forum, and the remote quarry of Mons. Porphyrites kept the empire's finest sculptors supplied with the most precious of all materials, the deep purple imperial porphyry. But Egypt's importance to Rome was not confined to its agricultural and mineral wealth. With unique access to both the Mediterranean and Red Seas, the country played a key role in Roman commerce especially trade with India, source of the oriental luxuries so beloved of the ruling class. Egypt's strategic location, at the nexus of routes, linking Arabia, Asia, Africa, and Europe, had been a prime reason for its prosperity as an independent nation, the same geographical advantage now ensured Egypt's subjugation by a succession of foreign empires. Rome, Byzantium, and Persia, the Caliphs, the Ottomans, and the British, all looked upon Egypt as a source of wealth and a trading hub without peer. Yet the cloud of exploitation had a silver lining. At the end of the 18th century AD, Napoleon launched an expedition to Egypt with the objective of annexing it as a French colony, dominating world trade, and undermining British control of India. The mission is remembered today not for its primary economic and strategic purpose, but for an almost incidental outcome the birth of Egyptology. Although, Bonaparte himself was little concerned with the rediscovery of ancient Egypt, he did take 150-odd savants with him when he set sail from Toulon on May 20, 1798. It is to their meticulous observations, published in the Monumental Description to Egypt, that we owe the beginnings of the scientific study of pharaonic civilization. While the savants are today given star billing in accounts of Napoleon's expedition, at the time they paled into insignificance.
beside the thousands of infantry and cavalry who journeyed with them. To the mouth of the Nile. Moreover, of the learned men who accompanied the invading French army, by far the most important, were the surveyors. Their task was to determine the feasibility of cutting a ship canal between the Mediterranean Sea and the Gulf of Suez. Strategic advantage, not scientific knowledge, was uppermost in Bonaparte's mind. And despite British Admiral Horatio Nelson's famous victory at the Battle of the Nile, echoing the great naval encounter between the Egyptians and the Sea Peoples 3,000 years earlier, the French got their way in the end, and the Suez Canal modern successor to Darius I's great project, was duly completed in 1869. The parallels between Egypt's ancient and modern history continued into the 20th century. Following in Napoleon's footsteps, another expansionary empire, the Third Reich, sought to occupy Egypt in order to dominate Middle Eastern trade routes, this time for the region's oil. As Axis Panzer divisions headed for the Eastern Delta, following the same route used by invading Libyan armies in the late New Kingdom. The Allied offensives at El Alamein in July and October 1942 marked a crucial turning point in the course of the Second World War. In Churchill's famous phrase, El Alamein was the end of the beginning. How ironic, therefore, that just 14 years later, the debacle of the Suez Crisis, which once again saw armies fighting over a small corner of Egypt, signaled the beginning of the end for the British. Empire. From the clash of ancient civilizations to the Cold War and beyond. Egypt has found itself at the center of things, if men could learn from history, what lessons it might teach us. 1. Alongside Egypt's geopolitical importance, the country's profound cultural influence has also been felt ever since Caesar sailed up the Nile with Cleopatra. Hand in hand with more material exports, the cult of Isis was carried from Egypt throughout the Roman world even as far as the shores of Britain. Its impact was significant and long-lasting, especially in Egypt's old stamping ground of the Near East. Despite the proscription of heathen cults by the Emperor Justinian in AD 553, the deep wellspring of ancient Egyptian religion proved a fertile source for the development of early Christianity. For Isis and Horus, substitute, virgin and child, the iconography, and much of the underlying theology, remained virtually identical. On a subconscious level, the allure of pharaonic civilization has proved irresistible to the Romans and their successors in the West. Beginning with Hadrian's villa at Tivoli and the Egyptianizing frescoes of Pompeii, and continuing down to the present day with Art Deco. Jewelry in the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas, ancient Egypt has continued to exert a powerful influence on Western art and architecture. Individuals and popular movements, too, have appropriated pharaonic ideas in pursuit of their particular cause. Akhenaten, to take just one example, has been co-opted as a role. Modeled by Freudian psychoanalysts, Protestant fundamentalists, fascists, Afrocentrists, New Age spiritualists, and gay rights. Campaigners. Hollywood has been especially mesmerized by ancient Egypt's blend of exoticism and antiquity, this fascination giving rise to a succession of hugely popular films, from the Ten Commandments and Cleopatra to Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Scorpion King. In short, through Roman rule, the coming of Christianity, the Arab conquest, and the vicissitudes of the modern world, ancient Egypt as a concept and an ideal has not only survived but prospered. The rulers of the Nile Valley and their hard-pressed subjects succeeded in creating a uniquely powerful culture, one that has fascinated and bewitched all who have come into contact with it, from Alexander the Great to Agatha Christie. Today, in film and literature, and through architecture, design, and tourism, the civilization of the pharaohs is alive and well in the imaginations of people the world over. The ancient Egyptians could not have wished for more.